Yes. Right. Uh, we, we will once again, we will once again get started, try and get started with uh, today's on uh, on the Badoon in Kuwait, the status community of Kuwait. We're going to start with a film, a nine minute film, um, and after which we will embark upon the program, hopefully during which we will sort out to some of these technical issues while the film is being shown. So hopefully my colleague Abbas will will be able to show the film now and after after that we'll we'll get into the, the seminar proper. Today's session is meant to be quite informal in any case. It will be based around a discussion. And as a preface before we embark upon the film, just want to say at the outset that uh, the lawyer uh, Mohammed Al Humaidi uh, who was due to join us, sadly cannot join us. He's not well. Um, and in respect to the, um, the discussion regarding the laws, we will, we will do that uh, as, a, as a general discussion with some of the participants who are here today. So Abbas, if you're ready, or Andrew, if you're ready to, uh, to kick us off with the film, um, that it's a nine-minute film. Thank you. Thanks very much. Without recognition, without a nationality, Bedouin citizens in Kuwait. Bedouin in Kuwait lives between two lifestyles, a life of welfare that surrounds them and a life of fear that dominates them. What does it mean for them to be classified under the category of Bedouin in Kuwait in the country of oil and constitutional rights? According to the United Nations charters, it's not permissible for a person to be without an identity and a nationality to take refuge in a world that is mainly based on obtaining a recognized identity and nationality to know his basic human rights. Although the problem of stateless persons is spread almost all over the world, it is considered more evident and a tragedy in Kuwait. And due to its seriousness, it can be said that the Bidun problem in Kuwait analyzes what can be called the diaspora and the homeland. This is Tayman, the main focus of Bidun. As you can see, the distance of the Bidun is about 100 to 150 miles from the top and the top. This is why the Bidun group are making every effort to gain official recognition of their rights to enjoy the nationality that they are striving to obtain from the government that still doesn't recognize this right. The only recognition that the Bedouin receives in Kuwait is the legal definition as Kuwaiti law refers to these people as stateless persons. They complain of discrimination against them on all levels and the difficulty of enjoying basic state services such as education, housing, employment, healthcare, and others. The story of the Bidun in Kuwait began with the tribe's people who, after the emergence of oil in Kuwait, they changed from Kuwaitis to Kuwaitis Bedouins, non-Kuwaitis, stateless, and finally, to illegal residents. Practically, the Bidun problem was not of significant meaning before Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in August 1990, the Bedouin enjoyed many of the privileges that Kuwaiti citizens could obtain. After the liberation of Kuwait from the Iraqi invasion in February 1991, the government authorities launched a violent clearance campaign against the Bedouin under the pretext of their cooperation with the Iraqi occupation. This violent policy caused the migration of thousands of stateless persons from Kuwait to other parts of the world as refugees. It reduced their number to between 90 and 110,000 people by 2010. They also lost most of their privileges during this period, including access to government jobs, free health care, or even to obtain birth and marriage certificates. The Bidun became deprived of basic rights such as education, health care, and the right to employment. 
تقايل في تصريح لك من البدون قمريون ونسيت منهم جنسية جزر القمر. In 2014, a controversial statement was issued by the Assistant Under Secretary of the Ministry of the Interior, where he said that tens of thousands of stateless people بدون could obtain the economic citizenship of the Republic of Comoros as they register as citizens of the African country, whereas those who come to this step will receive government facilities represented by permanent residency, free education, and health care. Naturally, the statement faced angry reactions from the Bidun, who considered it is a great insult to them, which led to the failure to implement any of its contents. وبالنسبه لجزر الغلم الغمر هذا كلام فاضي طبعا والله الدوله هي جزر القمر تاكدنا الحين وتبينت الخطه واضحه طبعا هذه تعتبر جريمه اتجار البشر دوليه The Bedouin were held demonstrations to demand their rights in the Jahra area in 2011 in which they clashed with the Kuwaiti police and injured some of them and after the Kuwaiti National Assembly refused to rediscuss the Bidun Rights Report, so a free Bidun youth group and many committees and organizations were established, seeking to internationalize their case with the help of a third party to obtain their rights. And their actions of the representatives of the National Assembly were directed towards the necessity of solving the Bidun problem to save Kuwait's international reputation. المشكلة في هذه القضية بالذات أن هناك من يستحق الجنسية يجب أن يجنس وهناك من لا يستحق الجنسية يجب أن يعني يتعامل معه بطريقة أخرى كل هذا لم يتم تصريحات بعض المسؤولين في وزارة الداخلية هنا وهناك نحن كمشرعين لا تعنينا لا من قريب ولا من بعيد وإنما ما يعنينا ماذا ستقدم الحكومة لحل هذه المشكلة ولحل هذه الأزمة also, the decision to naturalize 2,000 people annually will not solve this issue for 50 years, as Kuwait is under criticism from international human rights organizations and embarrassment in international forums. We would like to draw the Council's attention to Kuwait's ongoing human rights violations, especially concerning non-citizen and stateless person, also known as Bidzun, in contravention to recommendations it received during its second cycle, UPR, in 2015. This was my first incident to see uh, uh, Tema and to see how the stateless people live, live in Kuwait. And uh, uh, when I entered these houses, I, I realized that there is a, a great difference between what we, what we live in as Kuwaitis and how the people in Taima or the stateless people in Kuwait are living. The standards of living are totally different. Uh, and it's not just about poverty, it's about complications. It's complicated life in general. And for me, one of the very major, you know, apart from poverty, complications, uh, and, and all sorts of uh, uh, marginalization that I felt uh, when I was there, uh, one, of, one of the main uh, uh, incidents that really affected me is that uh, this the story of a, of a young girl who died in this fire uh, and she was 13 years old and, I, and when I was talking to her to her auntie and her father they were very uh, very much uh, uh, in tears because the girl didn't have a birth certificate neither a death certificate uh, and for me this was very very cruel I mean to realize that there's a person who have been deprived of any kind of identity uh, she's been 13 years in, her, in life, but there's no evidence that she has ever existed. We are reaching now to a point that we stop anymore to give evidence to everyone that we are related to Kuwait. Because, finish, uh, already we done a lot and all everyone know that exactly that we are Kuwaitis, we are citizens, but the government having another plan. So the community itself, alhamdulillah, yani, thanks to God that we reached to the point that all the community know exactly the Bedouin related to Kuwait, but there is, uh, there is some uh, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, a problem between the government and us. It's like, uh, what do you call it? Mushkila uh, siyasiya. Okay. Yeah, political problem, yes. Yeah. Despite this, the Bedouin group still lives hope in solving their problem and recognizing their rights to acquire a nationality and the nation's recognition of them as citizens. And until that hope is achieved, 
the Bedouin will continue to live with fear and organized exclusion. I'm Kuwaiti, and my Kuwaiti, and my Kuwaiti, and we'll stay on this earth until the end of the day. Welcome back, everyone. I hope some of the technical issues have been sorted. We are going to start the seminar proper now with a uh, with an opening discourse from Nasser Alanisi, one of the co-sponsors of today's event. Nasser is a long-term, uh, long-term observer, participant of Kuwaiti stateless activities. His Kuwaiti Community Center has given a huge amount of support to uh, individuals outside the country, particularly in the UK. Nasser, I'll start your speech, your, your, your intervention. Thanks very much. Okay, okay, thank you, Rory. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very hard to talk about a Bedouin. It's very hard to believe you are a Bedouin, but you are one of thousands of people who are born in a country called Kuwait find themselves deprived of nationality, deprived from their society, and deprived from the most basic human rights, such as education, work, and health care, and from obtaining official papers and proofs, and they are subjected to many restrictions. Bidon means continuous history of suffering. They, are, they inherit the deprivation generation and gen after generation. Those who Leave Kuwait are facing a new problems, such as language, culture, and trying to acquire a new legal status. The Bedouin believe that there is no difference between them and the member of the Kuwaiti society because society prior to the 1959 law mean all of them were without citizenship. However, the Bedouin people became a victim of the government's policy and uneducated grandparents who most of them are Bedouins who are not concerned about the importance of acquiring Bedouins. In the past, Bedouins were ashamed to discuss the issue of the Bedouin, so people knew that they belonged to this oppressive group and they had hoped that the government would resolve this issue, but this hope has gone unheeded. The contradiction clearly surrounding the government's behavior toward this disadvantaged group which contributes to the complexity of the problem. How can a person carry a Kuwaiti birth certificate providing his birth in Kuwait before the constitution was drawn up and before Kuwait even became a state and described him as an illegal resident? And how can you try to convince me that a person works for the country's army or police and that he is an illegal resident? And even more unbelievable, the children of Kuwaiti women also they are called them illegal residents. Unfortunately, the government gave us many titles, including sons of Badia, without non Kuwaiti illegal residents. The government sometimes wishes to remove us from the map, even though so it had counted us among the population of Kuwait of Kuwait for many years. After the countries of the world came to help Kuwait and liberate it from the Iraq invasion 1990-91. The government issued a system of social isolation of, for the Bedouin, preventing their children from entering public schools and making them vulnerable ignorance and illiteracy. The government forbade them from working, leading to poverty. And the, and the Bedouin presence in specific area of the country contributed to their separation and their isolation from the wider society. These were the inevitable result of continuous and increasing pressure by authorities. This had led to establishment of a number of Bedouin buying fake passports, either for immigration or in order to, for them to work and live in, the, in their country. This situation a phenomenon of honor to forget passport. The escalating pressure made some 
Bedouin commit suicide, and many Bedouin women are left without merit and no education. Many Bedouin have died as a result of being deprived of medication. More than 150,000 people, approximately a quarter of Kuwaiti population, are persecuted, and the United Nations ignores them and ignores more than 60 years of suffering and considering Kuwait as country of humanity. One of the most important efforts facing the Bedouin currently is the pandemic, which makes the situation worse and worse, especially with the difficulty of obtaining health care and the increase of the difficulty of obtaining work. Even those who work in the private sector or the black market have been deprived of their salaries for and some have reduced their salaries to half of what is used to be. A current pressing issue in the Bedouin Bill, which submitted by, by Merzug al Khanim, the Speaker of the Kuwait National Assembly, who sought to increase his pressure in the exhausted Bedouin, as was established in 2001 to represent the Kuwaiti Bedouin community in the United Kingdom. We don't have any aspiration for political office. Our aim is to raise the level of knowledge and interest in the issue of the Bidun and to help our brothers and sisters abroad to settle and integrate. I would like to remind Kuwaiti leaders and other world leaders and all those interested in the Bidun issue in Kuwait, recognition made by former speaker of parliament, Ahmed, Kuwait and it is record, uh, recorded as requested the Bedouin as Kuwaiti and that any measures against the group are considered illegal because the state considered them Kuwaitis. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next up, we have a General discussion about being Bedouin, being stateless, with Abdul Hakim Al Fadli, um, Ahmed Matar, and uh, Batul Hamad, two of those joining us from Kuwait itself. Can you both hear me? Um, yes, I can. I can hear everybody white and clear. Great. And Hakim and Ahmed, can you hear me as well? Yes, Lord, I can hear you. Fantastic. I want to start with you, <clears throat> Hakim, just really quickly, if you could tell me what has happened in this past week with... <coughs> draft legislation going to the sudden pulling of that draft legislation with uh, some drama in Parliament. What what <coughs> happened and why was that important? Okay. Yes. Drory. <coughs> Hello. You can't hear me? Okay. Drory. I can hear you. Yes. I will, first, I will start my camera, then I will start. Uh, Drory, I will, yes. I will, I will, I'm choosing to I will, I'll speak yes. in Arabic. Uh, this, okay? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay. First of all. For can those see. of you who are, who are speaking in this section, please unmute yeah. and turn on your cameras if you wish. Okay. You can see me and you can hear me good. Rory? I think so. I, I, I think so. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, good evening for everyone and thanks to everyone to participate in this event. Uh, I will speak in Arabic for this because there is a lot of details. Later, I will also uh, 
work uh, and t- talk about the, the 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 dangers of the of the bear of Marzouk al Ghanem. I will first of all speak in Arabic. مساكم الله بالخير مساء الخير الجميع ويعطيكم العافية وشاكر لكم الجميع انضمامكم لهذا لهذه الندوة وهذا الإيفنت العالمي حول قضية كويتي البدون وتحديدا حول آخر تحديثات آخر تحديثات قضية كويتي البدون في الأسابيع الماضية السابقة كان هناك محاولة وضغط كبير من من السيد مرزوق الغانم رئيس مجلس الأمة الكويتي لمحاولة تمرير قانون يعني كان من الممكن أن يدمر مجتمع كويتي البدون ويمسح حوية البدون إلى الأبد فكانت لنا محاولات لتأخير وتبطيل ويعني وإيقاف هذا القانون عبر أولا تعطيلة في لجنة لجنة اللجنة عفوا اللجنة اللي هو لجنة دستورية لتمرير قوانين مجلس الأمة ومن ثم لجنة الداخلية والدفاع اللي حصل في هذه الفترة إن كان هناك محاولات حثيثة من الطرفين من عندنا منا إحنا مجتمع كويتي البدون وأيضا من الطرف الآخر اللي هو السيد مرزوق الغانم ومجموعة من من الأعضاء اللي تعاونوا مع فيها المسألة هذه حاولوا تمرير هذا القانون وخليني أنا استعرض استعرض ليش إحنا معترضين على تمرير هذا القانون تحديدا قانون مرزوق الغانم ونقدر نتكلم في هالمسألة نقول خطو يعني نقول خطورة مشروع مشروع قانون مرزوق الغانم الخطورة فيه إنه هو هو قانون لمس حوية كويتي البدون بقوة تماما وللأبد مرة واحدة اثنين هو التشريع لجميع انتهاكات الجهاز المركزي اللي حصلت خلال العشر سنوات اللي اللي فاتت والحرمان والاضطهاد والابتزاز اللي حصل مجتمع كويتي البدون ثلاثة هو محاولة لتوريد مؤسسات حكومية جديدة بالاستمرار في التضييق على على البدون واستحداث منصات جديدة أو مؤسسات جديدة لأخذ زمام العمل أو والله أخذ الملفات وبقية المعلومات اللي اللي أحصتها الجهزة السابقة من من جهاز المركزي وغيرها ومحاولة التضييق على البدون أربعة هو ابتزاز مجتمع الكويتيين البدون عبر التشريع لإبعاد البدون خارج البلاد بعد إقرار القانون وضع جدل جدول زمني لإرغام البدون على شراء جوازات سفر من دول محددة وبالاتفاق مع مع الدولة والضغط عليهم في حالة تأخير أو عدم شراء هذه الجوازات عبر التلويح باعتبار المخالفين أو الرافضين من الكويتي البدون لها لذلك لذلك الأمر هم مخالفين للإقامة وبالتالي إبعادهم خارج البلاد بقوة القانون قوة القانون اللي اللي يعني كان يعني مرزوق الغام الغانم يحاول يفرض على مجتمع الكويتي البدون وضرب بعرض الحائط كل مؤسسات المجتمع المدني جمعية المحامين أيضا جمع عفوا جمعية المحامين وقانونهم وأيضا مجموعة من ناشطين ومدافعين عن حقوق الإنسان مجموعة كبيرة من من المحامين اللي اشتغلوا على هذا القانون أيضا مجموعة كبيرة من 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 أعضاء مجلس الأمة اللي اللي عملوا على قانون لمدة شهور طويلة وأيضا الأهم قرار ورأي مجتمع كويتي البدون ضرب بكل هؤلاء ضرب فيهم عرض الحائط واستمر في محاولة ابتزاز والضغط على مجتمع الكويتي البدون وإقرار هذا القانون بالقوة وعبر استغلال الأدوات والأدوات داخل مجلس الأمة واستغلال اللجان واستغلال كثير من الشخص وأعضاء مجلس الأمة لتمرير هذا القانون إلا أن لله الحمد رب العالمين أن إحنا خلال هذه الفترة اللي فاتت عملنا بالضبط عملنا لوبينج يعني كان عندنا لوبي للضغط على مجموعة من الأعضاء مجلس الأمة وتحديدا في اللجان لجنة التشريعية وأيضا اللجنة اللي هو لجنة تابعة لوزارة الداخلية والدفاع ضغطنا على 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 المجموعة اللي موجودة في في هذه اللجان اللجنتين إلى أن نجحنا لله الحمد إن ينتهي الفصل العقاد وينتهي ينتهي يعني الدور العقاد هذا بالكامل ومرزوق الغانم ما جاء ما نجح إنه يمر هذا القانون شكرا تفضل دروري <تصفيق> thanks دروري thanks thanks حكيم um, I confess okay. I did let's... not understand I did not understand okay. all of that let, let, okay let, let me let me just to to say the part in English please okay because which it will be in brief okay the seriousness of of Marzouk al Ghanem bail is why be, uh, is first or number one is why being why and and force ide- uh, the why and force identity shifting for of the Kuwaiti bidon completely one time and forever. Second, 
registration for all the violation of of the central apparatus with the ten, with, with the, within the, the last ten years. Three, the ambition, the ambition and of a new government institution to continue to crack down on the Bedouin community. Three, four, sorry. Start mailing the Bedouin community through legislation to deport the Bedouin outside the country after the new, the, the new law is passed and a time, a time table was set to compel the Bedouin to buy passport from specific countries in agreement with the state and pressure them in case of delay or not buying these passport by treating the, the Bedouin or treating that the, the violators of the community or those who is who's, who's refusing to do so uh, uh, to be uh, uh, to be uh, resistive violators and those uh, and to be deported outside the country if they not uh, comply, comply with that law. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Hakim. We 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 had intended to come to the legal aspects um, of what happened a little bit later on as well, but that's that, that's incredibly useful. Um, Ahmed Matar, who is a student, um, master in London, and he joins us as well. Ahmed, what has the past week meant to you, and what are the challenges that present to the, the stateless community of Kuwait? in advance and really for the the forthcoming parliamentary election is there a chance that all that scenario that that quite negative scenario that abdul hakim has described is is, is can, can that be overturned is there is there some way that we can uh we can change this scenario yes uh can you hear me Drew? can I, can everybody hear me uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to add to uh, what Hakim has uh, uh, started. Uh, uh, um, today's situation of the Bedouin uh, is not something new. It's uh, a result of uh, processes of identity politics that had been started uh, 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 since the state's uh, formation in 1961. And uh, the, the, this identity uh, politics began by uh, changing the Bedouin, actually creating the Bedouin out of the indigenous population of Kuwait, then converting them to uh, a stateless population, then uh, uh, converting them to illegal residents in 1986, and now uh, effort uh, being made to convert the Bedouin into uh, uh, deportable aliens. Uh, this is what Hakim was talking about in uh, uh, with regard to uh, the new bill, the new Bedouin bill. Now, in order to address these processes, the attempts to to uh, 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 inflict more violence on the Bedouin, uh, I think we need to uh, maybe understand the essential problem. You know uh, what, what the what the challenges. Uh, uh, the Bedouin community have. Uh, so sorry, is it? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So what we have, the challenges we have. On the one hand, we have the Bedouin community demanding their right to belong to their homeland, to, to demanding their uh, Kuwaiti identity. Uh, but on the other hand, we have uh, the state that is using divisive policies to uh, 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 divide the people, uh, the, the Bedouin people, into uh, 19, those who have 1965, those who, who are half Kuwaitis, those who, who uh, worked in oil sector, those who uh, uh, worked for military, and those who offered uh, uh, special services to the states. And this is, uh, I think, is all rubbish, you know? Who, who decides what uh, something is like a special service or not? Um, so against this backdrop, I think the Bedouin uh, community needs to 
while they want to affiliate themselves with the uh, uh, Kuwaiti identity to be Kuwaiti, in order to achieve that, we need to challenge the divisions that are inflicted on us by perhaps by essentializing under one unifying uh, 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 identity that allows the Bedouin to become a one entity to create a momentum that uh, 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 is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenging, you know, these, these divisions. Um, but the problem is, again, uh, is with how the identity of the Bedouin constructed, not only in Kuwait, not only by the institutions of the country, but also outside by the international community, by uh, uh, states, by the United Nations, UNHCR, and by researchers, you know. And the challenge here, here I think, the Bedouin, for example, based on my experience in the UK, the dominant narrative, you know, the identity of the Bedouin, and I think this is one of the reasons that we don't receive support from the international community, because there is a lot of confusion, there is a lot of mystification or surrounding the Bedouin identity. Uh, and I think uh, the problem is that the Bedouin case is always constructed without the historical context, you know? So what I suggest in order to help the Bedouin be recognized, be listened to, we, we should also, maybe researchers, NGOs, everyone who is dealing with the Bedouin case should explore the, the historical context, maybe ask two essential questions. One, are we dealing with a state that, was ex that existed and then had a population that became stateless? Or we had an indigenous population then became stateless as a result of modern state formation? Because then we, ha we are dealing with two different scenarios. We are dealing with people who have legitimate claims for identity, for existence, for belonging in their, in their, in their country. Or we have a population that allegedly uh, uh, like came to the country by one way or another, maybe from the blue, and became stateless, and then became a burden to the state. You know? So... And by by referring to the Bedou, yes, yes, truly. But but I, I had sorry to interrupt. I mean, it, it's incredible. This is this is fundamental. But how do we get around to changing this scenario? What what can we do? What what's the practical application of what you're saying today, tomorrow, when the election comes? Yeah, I think I think that uh, uh, NGOs, people who are supporting the Bedouin, should use evidence, mm. and there is a number of evidence by Kuwaiti parliamentarians, former speaker of the Kuwaiti National Assembly, Ahmed Al Sadun, uh, testimonies by ministers, by parliamentarians, lawyers, Kuwaiti citizens, that the state has misinformed the international community. When we put that in writing and address it to the relevant organizations, to the Kuwaiti parliament, to supporters of Kuwait, here we, ha we, have, we have evidence that you have been misinforming the international community, that so-called illegal resident identity you are creating for the Bedouin is an imprecise framing of the of the of the problem because also we have evidence where hakim and a group of activists went themselves to the central apparatus demanding the nationality that the apparatus is claiming for the bedouin like bedouin having having you know concealed their their, uh, uh, their original identities their nationalities so we ha we have we have because at the end of the day, the, the burden, you know, of proof should be on, on, on the state, you know. 
But do you do you you're a you're you're a stateless? Uh, you know you you've you've written a lot on these issues. Um, we have joining us today people from big human rights organizations and also those who are actually Kuwaiti. Do you think there's something practical that you, as a as an activist, Hakim as an activist, um, and and other you know young activists who I'm going to come to in one minute, is there something that you can imagine happening now, or that you'd like to see happen now that can be applied, some sort of appeal, action, leverage that you as an activist, or Hakim as an activist, that you'd like to see uh, 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 happen before the election? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think the most urgent thing, and especially during the uh, uh, pandemic, you know, circumstances, the most urgent thing is to address the, the problems of the uh, Bedouin women and Bedouin children and Bedouin of special needs who mm. hardly hit by the pandemic. Because th this, I, th I don't think sh anyone would, would, would say two words about it, you know. We have people who are yeah. being kicked out of them uh, from their houses. We have children who cannot join school. So we can tackle the issue from different perspectives. We have the conventions on child, child rights. We have ch uh, women rights, the people uh, with special needs. These, I think, should be put as an urgent uh, question and should be addressed even before the election. Immediately, I would say, we have to address these questions parallelly with our uh, uh, claims for, for uh, you know, finding a decisive solution for our problem that uh, you're supported by ample evidence that we have. Okay, um, I want to come to Batul, if you don't mind, us from Kuwait. Hello, Patrick, you, you're, a, you're a student in international relations. You are aware of these discourses, these debates and so on. You're living it. Uh, you're living your reality um, in the same space as Hakim. You're a woman. Does it make a difference to you that you are a woman? How does it affect you differently? And what would you like to see? Um, to be honest, being a woman and just trying to grasp a space to express yourself is by itself a big challenge. And this is like something in a patriarchal society, and I'm not attacking anyone, but it's just saying it in a patriarchal society that poses as a problem at the very beginning. Like when you want to claim your space as a woman and then think about it this way, um, I'm not only looking at it from a point of view of being a woman, here we meet with an intersectionality of some sorts. I am not only a woman, I am also Bidu. So I fall under a couple of other objects. I might have a lot more privileges than other people, and that's something I have to address. I am not as well informed as uh, Abdul Hakim Fadli or Ahmed Matar. I'm not. Hmm. I am still young, and I learn. I learn every time I hear them speak. I grew up watching them. I grew up watching them, but as a woman, um, the closest I got to seeing an image of a woman out there that is Bedouin, that is speaking out clearly, I think I would have to say Ada Sadun or Khadija Shimri. Those are the, the few that I've seen. But what I hope to see, especially during the COVID pandemic and seeing how it affected women specifically, um, a group of uh, Bedouin women, we started a page that is specifically catering to connecting between women with each other. We need to see each other. We need to view each other. Because here's the thing, you can't unify like the Bedouin identity. You can't because we are not one person. And that is something that I feel like we don't address enough. The Bedouin community is made up of different people from different perspectives. So to me, to be honest, uh, I feel like as a woman, it makes a difference. I need to see people that, that look like me, that look like me, meaning like Bedouin women that are out there. It's scary, yes, but you see our men. And especially if you're in a space where uh, men being activists is there, it's available for everyone. But me being a woman, no, I can go to a douaniya and ask what's going on. I can't. That space is not available for me. But but Batul, you you uh, 
you know, you live coming up in, 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 in a month. What would you like to see? How, would you, how do you see politics playing out in a way that would benefit, on the one hand, women, on the other hand, jointly in this, in this complex intersectionality, um, the overall situation? What would you like to see happen on the 5th of December? Um, I would like to see more women in Parliament, definitely. In the National Assembly, I want to see more women, 100% more women, not one woman, a couple of women that voice different opinions, different views. That's something that I want to see because there are different aspects that we haven't tackled. Like, for example, um, a Kuwaiti woman passing on her citizenship to her kids. And I am a daughter of a Kuwaiti mother. My mom is Kuwaiti. Mm. So I want to see that happen. And I want to see more people talking about it. I want to see more acknowledgement of individuality, to be honest. I am tired of a unified discourse. I am I'm tired of that. Just, I, I just want to pick on something, pick up on something you've just said. You've just said that your mum is a Kuwaiti national, so your dad is a Bedouin, and on that basis, your your uh, your ability to obtain Kuwaiti citizenship has been restricted. Correct? Yes, but here's the thing: if I want to get my nationality, I want to get it through my dad, not through my mom. Not because Why, is I... that? Why do you say that? To me, because being Bedouin is a big part of my identity. It's not, mm -hmm. I want to, like, I want to acknowledge that because if you give a Bedouin a Kuwaiti citizenship, that's different from me getting it based on a daughter of a Kuwaiti mother. Because here, da daughters or, like, children of Kuwaiti mothers, they could be non-Kuwaiti, they could be Egyptian, they could be Jordanian, they could be a lot of different nationalities. But to me... I think being Bedouin is not, I think, I know, it's part of my identity, it's part of who I am. Will you, your side, to reach out to any of the women candidates standing, even though you can't vote, even though you're not part of that political process, will you try to address them and ask them to take up your issues, the things that concern you as a woman, as somebody as, from the stateless community? Okay, I do believe we do have a power. It's a soft power. The Bedouin okay. community has soft power. Uh, we're on a grassroots level. We can't really address them because being a woman, I again, I don't have access to a duania that I could go. And even if it is it's during this pandemic, it's yeah. a bit restricted. But to me, for sure, I, to be honest, I have reached to some, I would say, National Assembly members I don't think I like the way that they look at me and the way that they address me. Um, Is and that even, the reasons of patriarchy? Um, it might be patriarchy. It might be also a power dynamic. Like when there's a power dynamic, it's there. You can see it when you're when you're Bedouin. You you see it. You feel it. It's it's something that's in the air. It's the elephant in the room. So definitely, yeah, I would keep on addressing it. And I hope there are a couple of uh, female. Uh, parliament members or like uh, electees that want to get into the National Assembly, I do hope that some of them do change their narratives when it comes to being Bedouin and the Bedouin community as a whole, because it is outrageous, some of the points of views that they make, and considering that they're going to be in the parliament, they need a shift into their dynamic. Oh, sorry, can I make okay, one more? Okay, we have just one minute. <laughs> we have one minute left in this session to a power dynamic i'd like to come back uh to to hakim on this question how can we change the power dynamic and i want to ask that to betul i want to ask that to hakim and to ahmed jabber uh, maybe hakim first how do we change that power dynamic just in just your immediate feelings, is it joint, is it internal, is it external, is it what, what's the trick? What, how, does this, how does this come together? First of all, hello, Drory? We're good, I can hear, we can hear you. Okay, first of all, Drory, first of all, there is nine days, just only nine days to finish from the central abratus. Central Abratis must go forever. Everyone, every human rights organization, every connection 
you people have internationally it's politics or human rights or academic or media you you should all of you people you should help us now you should use it now just to say central apparatus must go now this is the beginning the central apparatus or the central agency who's who's uh, t- blackmailing the bedouin for the last 10 years must go now this is the beginning this is the beginning thank you <clears throat> Rory, Ahmed. Yeah. I hope you got. Yeah, this. tell me how to. Uh, We've only got about a minute left of this session. Sorry. Yes. I mean, you're breaking up. Uh, you're breaking up at this end. Yes. We, you, all of you people, all of you people, you you should use your your power, your connections, your your social uh, social. Uh, media or your your political uh, political uh, connections uh, also the media the uh, the academic also me- all everything you you can use and you ca- you should all of you uh, should release uh, statements against the 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 central apparatus or the central agency central agency should go now the kuwaiti be doing right now in this in this era we need it to go now this is there is only nine days we are in, uh, in a race against the time it's only nine okay. days this is the most this is the most important right it should go now and and one thing one thing also when it is sh- with, when it is going forever inshallah okay. they should not transfer this power to the ministry of interior we will not accept to uh, uh, to a military guy uh, whoever to can try to control us like 1990s again to a civilian okay. uh, department or civilian uh, history this this, this I, is the, the I, very I, important I keep, I need, the, need, the next Ahmed, Ahmed, if you can hear me just in a in a in a real sentence just really really briefly before we we move to Nawaf al and um, and the perception in Kuwaiti society. What is your sense, Ahmed, of of how this power dynamic that Batu referred to, that Hakim is talking about, the clear appeals that he's making? How do you see it changing? How can it change? Uh, I think uh, uh, very briefly. I think we we can change tilt the balance of power by having a platform. We need a platform. We Bedouins, we do not have a platform that allows us to present our, represent uh, ourselves uh, freely. Uh, you know, people are suppressed in Kuwait. Outside, people are afraid, also discouraged. So what we need, we need a, a platform that allows us to have free speech. And this, this is our fundamental human rights. Uh, uh, one of uh, our fundamental human rights. And also adding to Hakim's point, uh, our problem is not only the central apparatus. The central apparatus is part of a whole system. We have parliamentarians. We have a dominant class that is pushing. Today they're using the central apparatus. They're using media. Tomorrow they will find anything. They, they will use the mosque. They will use the school. They will use anything against the Bedouin. Mm. This is what we should have a more comprehensive vision that we are, what kind of structures we are dealing with. But again, in order to challenge the balance of power, you know, to uh, uh, like to fit ourselves in this unbalanced power relations, we need a platform because it's unfair that one like dominant class have all the means, all the resources to frame us in ways they want, use the media, use everything, while we are suppressed, our voice is uh, made silent, you know? So if you can do anything, if international community can do anything, just work on how to create a space for the Bedouin inside, outside Kuwait to represent themselves, to make themselves heard. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, Sorry, sorry. 
yeah, it has Sorry, to be really, really important to 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 well, know what's going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, yeah, yeah. One notice that uh, Muhammad Salam is with us, and please, uh, after Nawaf, you 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 should give him the the chance to because as a, okay, thank you. Um, Hakim and Hakim and Ahmed, um, you know, we have uh, because because Mohammed Al Humaydi was not able to join us today because of sickness. I think after Nawaf and after Hadil, I want to come back to Mohammed Salam, back to Ahmed to to talk a little bit more about the legal perspective. And by the way, to you both, I will ask what was good in the government proposed bill. I want to challenge you on what possibly, possibly could be good in those in those bills. But right now, um, gentlemen and Beto Batul, thank you very, very much. Please stay with us, of course. Um, and I want now to I want to come to back to, Ahmed, to Ahmed to, to talk now, Nawaf, I just to want you to both. ask you I one will... simple question. What is your assessment of how the Kuwaiti population, the Kuwaiti people, those with the citizenship of, of, of Kuwait, what do they think about these, these people who are illegal residents of the country? Do some of them think, oh, God, these illegal residents, they really need to go back to their own country? Or is there some element of Kuwaiti population that think that these people amongst them, living amongst them, have been unfairly treated and need to be given Kuwaiti citizenship? So, Nawaf, Nawaf Al-Handal. Uh, thank, you, Dori, thank, you. thank you, Dori. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to speak in Arabic, if you let me. Um, I think أنا أعتقد أن المجتمع الكويتي منقسم تقريبا كون نحن مجتمع باعتقادي أن نحن مجتمع عنصري من الأساس فغالبية المجتمع أو يوجد نسبة كبيرة بالمجتمع هو لا يرى أن للبدون حق في الحصول على الجنسية الكويتية أو لا يرى أنهم مواطنين من الأساس ولكن نعم في جزء من المجتمع أيضا والآن أصبح الوعي أكثر يعني بالفضل بفضل نشاط الكويتيين البدون وبفضل نشاط بعض الناشطين في الكويت هم يرون الآن أن البدون حق وأنهم يعاملون معاملة سيئة خصوصا خصوصا بعد التعنت وتعسف الجهاز المركزي وجميع بالنسبة لي جميع أجهزة الدولة بمعاملتهم بطريقة سيئة جدا بما فيها أخذ سلب الحقوق بالقوة كالتعليم كالعلاج وفي شواهد كثيرة يعني حصلت بالأمور بالسنوات الأخيرة فأعتقد أن المجتمع منقسم إلى جزئين مجتمع يؤيد ومع قمع البدون ومع إظهار جنسياتهم كما يدعي الجهاز المركزي الذي ادعى بوجود خمس ملايين وثيقة ولم يستطع عرض أي منها إلى الآن وهو يدعي أنها موجودة في البنك المركزي ويرفض إحالتها إلى يرفض إحالتها إلى النيابة أو إلى المحكمة فهذا أمر أمر سيء جدا ولكن هناك مواجهة أيضا ما بين المجتمع والجهاز المركزي المجتمع الآن يطالب الجهاز المركزي بالعمل على إظهار هذه الوثائق أو إيقاف هذه التصرفات السيئة والغير مجدية والتي أصبحت يعني تشكل الآن فضيحة للكويت كون أنا أنا شاركت في آخر استعراض دوري شامل للكويت في فبراير لاحظت أنه كل الدول وأغلبها كانوا يتحدثون عن مشكلة رئيسية واحدة وهي مشكلة البدون في الكويت ووجود الجهاز المركزي وممثل له في الجلسة يعني كان يتحدث بكذب بين كأنه التعليم بالمجان والعلاج العلاج بالمجان أيضا ويعاملون بمعاملة أفضل من المواطنين طبعا هذا كل الدعاءات يعني سيئة وفاشلة أعتقد أنهم يجب أن يتوقفوا عنها ويجب يجب إيقاف هذا الجهاز المركزي الذي عين نفسه ولي أمر للبدون 
اعتقد انه يجب ان يتوقف حالا حالا وليس ايضا كمان يعني تسع ايام بعد انتهاء مدته يجب ان يتوقف حالا لاظهار على الاقل حسن حسن البادره وحسن النيه في التعامل من اجل حل هذه القضيه بالشكل السليم. I didn't get all of that. Um, I gather you're talking about the central uh, system, central apparatus, and that there's largely two camps. I want to thank Thomas McGee for, uh, for providing some instant translation. Um, look, you have an election. You're a, you're a Kuwaiti national. You have an election coming. Um, how would you see things playing out for... for the Bedouin, for the stateless population, and what can be done inside the country to help these people? First, I'm a person who is committed to the elections and the elections from the year 2012 until now, from the change of the voice of the one. But I have some relationships, some of the friends who are آه الان يرشحون انفسهم للدخول الى البرلمان آه حقيقه تحدث تحدثت معهم شخصيا بشان قضيه البدون وكيف سيعمل على حلها اوائل يعني او اول فكره كانت موجوده هي محاوله رفض اي قانون يصدر من خلال مرزوق السيد مرزوق الغانم او الجهاز المركزي آه بصيغه اخرى يعني آه كون ان قانون مرزوق هو اساسا قانون الجهاز المركزي ولكن باسم السيد مرزوق الغانم آه هذه أول الأمور ثانيا العمل على إقرار قانون جمعية المحامين الذي عمل عليه عدد من النشطاء شاكرين جدا آه وصيغة بصيغة جيدة وهو أنا باعتقادي أنه هو منصف جدا منصف جدا للبدون أو لحل هذه القضية وحل هذه المعاناة وإيقافها لذلك أنا أتمنى أن يتبنى بعض المرشحين هذه الفكرة وهذه المعلومات والعمل عليها من خ... بشكل جدي وفعلي من داخل اللجان او في التصويتات العامه. Um, no, uh, fine. Thank you for that. And thank you, Thomas, for the translation. Um, I think uh, from, from what's uh, providing a bit of uh, translation. If, uh, if what Hadil has said is correct, he's saying are not going. Do you think that voting in Kuwait as a Kuwaiti national, is there a relevance to voting as a Kuwaiti citizen? Does it, does it mean anything? I've, I've lost, I've lost no, no F. Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can uh, hear you, yeah. Just Can you ask me the question again, please? Just, just simply, we're running fine. Hadil mentioned in a, in translation for me that uh, that that you're not going to vote, and I would just wanted to ask you whether voting as a Kuwaiti national, you're a Kuwaiti national, you can vote, vote can change or can it? I mean, do you feel? that it is important to vote? Uh, for me, yes, yes, it's very important, but um, uh, I boycott because the, I, 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 am, I am against the system how, how the election law is coming. Uh, because of this, I, I am in boycott and I, and I will not vote in, for, in, in this election. Okay.
Oh dear. One final question before we 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 turn we go back to to Hadil to talk about activism. One final question: Do you have any sense that the legal situation of the stateless people of Kuwait can be changed in the forthcoming parliament? Yeah, I I, th I think it, it will be changed, and uh, I think they are working in, uh, on it now, uh, because it's it's okay. it's make the, it's make some it's make a lot of headache now, and all the world now are watching Kuwait what what uh, how how they can dealing with this with this case. Uh, now they can't hide it, now they can't stop it, now they can't. Um, tell everyone we are so we, we are trying to solve it we are trying to finish the situation now they they want the real action to solve this problem Rory? Okay, I've frozen. I think there may be a few issues with uh, with my connection. Sorry, everybody. We are now going to thank you very much, Noaf. Um, that's You're welcome. that's really helpful. It's 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 really complex. Um, what some of the questions that I was asking you about the potential of change in. Uh, for the next election, kind of relate to what I'm, I, I want uh, to what I want Hadil to address, and that's activism. What sort of activism can can bring change in Kuwait? And I'd like to in Kuwait activism, inside Kuwait activism from inside the Bedouin community. Hadil, what is your what is your sense? of the role of in changing the the situation of the Bedouin. This Hadil, it's really quiet for us. I don't know if you can hear me, but it's really quiet at, at our end, I think. My microphone is on. We can barely, we, well, I can barely hear you. I think, I think I think that's the same for others as well. And there does seem to be some interference. I did, yes. So I, people are saying that they can see um, some of me and a quarter of Hadil. Okay, so it looks like Hadil has got uh, got connection problems. I would like to take the opportunity to open it up to to some of the questions that may be coming in um, to um, to the YouTube feed. So if if um, if we can if we can do that, 
uh, or indeed, uh, as maybe before Hadil comes back, Batul, do we have an opportunity to to come back to you? But if you're if you if you if you if you if you're there and, and and if you can hear me, do you think you could you could address this question of the power dynamic and what's up being on what's unfolding in respect to the forthcoming election? Is that something that that you might want to comment on? Um, yes, I'd love to comment on that. So now, when it comes to like changing the power dynamic, I feel like it should start with us on a grassroots level. When I say us, I mean the Bedouin community by itself, and especially I want to hear from more Bedouin women. I want them to find their voice, claim their space, and to honestly start with themselves, because nobody's going to make the space for you if you don't. So definitely power dynamics starts when you make some space for yourself. So that's my take on it. Thank you, Drury, for the chance. <laughs> the question is how? The question is how? I mean... Okay. How? There is a lot of aspects. For example, just start with your name and your face. A lot of Bedouin women or a lot of the Bedouin community are under, let's say, other accounts. Understand the struggle and th there's a lot of like, concerns when it comes to that. But this is who you are. If you want to be invisible, then that's also another issue. So you start by yourself. That's how you do it, the power dynamic to make yourself be heard. But when, you know, we talked about, you know, you talked about as a sort of a, 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 let's say a younger person and that you have known the activism of people like, um, uh, like, like Hakim for many years, you, you followed his work. The guy has been arrested, detained, and put in prison. In 2011, members of your community got together in Tema, in Arada Square. Um, they, they came together to, to call for their rights, and many were put into prison. Okay, putting your name forward, your face forward, standing up to patriarchy, standing up to an iniquitous situation. It's dangerous. It is dangerous. How do you navigate? Okay, my community, they're very brave. Like, I didn't, probably nobody can argue. That we see in Kuwait. Sorry, you're breaking up, Drury. You're breaking up. So, here's the thing. Their activism was great. It's still great. It's still very important. What I want to see, the youth. Give the youth a chance. I mean, the youth a chance, like, give them a chance to do what they want. For example, now I can see a lot of activism, not just through going to the streets or trying to throw away the patriarchy. No, activism can be through music, through awful approach, but it's very valid. And we're seeing that dynamic or the way that you protest change. It doesn't have to be by going to the streets. That's a very muscular view of it. That's a very patriarchal view of it. I feel like... We should be more open to other aspects. That is important. Going to the streets is important, but I'm not calling for that. I'm calling Excellent. for my vision. Thank you. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to take the criticism about that, that perspective. Um, just tell me, unpack a little bit more for me about the kind of activism that you'd like to see happening. And, and after, you, after you talk about that, I would like to try to come back to, uh, to Hadil, who will talk about who I wanted to ask about activism. But how do you see that non-patriarchal intersectionality respecting activism moving forward, Batul? How do you see that? How do you see that working? What, what does it look like? Community being given the space for other aspects through storytelling, for example. Storytelling can change a lot of aspects. A couple of years ago, we had Neda Faris create like Kuwait Poet Society, or she was one of the founders that created Kuwait Poet Society. And that really did open up the grounds for people. So through storytelling, through poetry, through uh, singing, that by itself is very strong. So I feel like that's something which civil societies can really take part of 
not uh, non-governmental organizations really they can take it to their own advantage even the government can use it they can create a space a forum for example to some extent i might be wrong but this is just my view for now so nobody come for me for right now i might change it in the future <laughs> right now yes this is how i feel so i just want to milk this a little bit more do you think a theater performance, a book of poetry, a song, um, a song about the stateless experience in Kuwait that could be sung by a kind of well-known singer, do you think that's going to have more of an impact than the kind of activism that ourselves, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Salam for Democracy, what, does it count for more in this modern setting that we're in in a, in a non-patriarchal way do you think that would cut more than 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 what we've seen so far i think both should work together nobody should take the place of the other because you're not just okay. fighting it on one level it's through millions of levels like i fight it through a grassroots level you fight it through through a institutional level so i feel that all of it is important. but definitely a theater performance would be very important because we being Arab and being Kuwaiti, we kind of got our history through oral history. So just having that there, that's very important. That's very important, 100%. Petro, thanks very much. In the session which we would have uh, had our our lawyer friend, uh, um, uh, Mohammed Al-Humaydi, sadly he's, he's ill, um, but I would like to invite back if he's uh, still online somewhere, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Matar, because Heather Alexander has asked um, if there is some capacity to reclaim Bedouin history, to uh, to push back against an, a, a, the government narrative such as it is. And, and if there's a way to recover Bedouin history, how can it push back against the government narrative. What does it take? Does it take what 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 Batul was talking about in a way? Does it take a theater performance, uh, activism, um, um, a film? What what is it? What what works? I don't know. Uh, yeah, from a legal perspective, I think uh, there there uh, there is a legal framework, international legal framework for. Uh, uh, the rights of indigenous populations, and this is a possibility within the uh, international law. Uh, I think uh, it's important to uh, revive kind of, you know, our uh, uh, history because this deactivates, you know, the framing of the government of the dominant class in Kuwait who are, who are claiming that the Bedouin uh, are newcomers, people who migrated to Kuwait, concealed their uh, so by documenting our our uh, indigenous history in Kuwait and in uh, uh, Arabia, uh, I think uh, we can challenge all uh, these claims. And uh, uh, while I appreciate, you know, artwork in uh, doing activism, uh, but I think uh, maybe we are in a very urgent situation that needs to be uh, 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 taken directly, you know, and urgently. Uh, 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 confronting uh, that are inflicted on the Bedouin. So I think from a legal perspective, we have, uh, because everything that is happening to the Bedouin in Kuwait is against the international law. And many things that are happening to the Bedouin in Kuwait are in violation to the constitution of Kuwait, because the constitution of Kuwait provides for, uh, for example, they subjectivity of crime while the the state is punishing families for uh, 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 suspicion of one of their extended uh, relatives so this is uh, in violation of constitution the constitution uh, calls for respect of the rights of children and women and this we do not have in uh, do not see happening uh, the constitution also calls for freedom of speech and this is also is not happening uh, the constitution calling for human dignity and this uh, uh, not happening so i think from a legal perspective we can use these legal tools legal frameworks the 
Kuwaiti constitution, the international law, the rights of indigenous populations, uh, the conventions on women uh, uh, rights, uh, on children rights, again, uh, as I said, uh, the uh, rights of people with special needs. Uh, I just need, I, I just think that we need expertise, specialists from NGOs to put together, together a kind of manifesto uh, or, or uh, 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 increase, maybe increase their efforts in uh, 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 addressing these issues uh, within the framework of international law. Uh, 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 I think there is a lot of potential, you know, uh, for for uh, doing something, for challenging what is happening to the Bidun. I think all we, we need is to use, I think, the right tools. And again, uh, as I asked before, maybe to have a platform where we can be heard. Because what is happening so far, there is one dominant structure imposing their like uh, narrative, their 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 uh, framing of the Bidun, whereas the Bidun are not uh, 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 allowed to uh, defend themselves. We are not allowed to to uh, to provide the narrative of our situation. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, our story is being told by, by someone else. You know, we need to play. It's our identity. It's our our situation. It's our life. We need to tell them our own story. We, we are not, like, for example, cancelling or preventing others from, uh, like, uh, hello? I, uh, I'm losing you. Look, uh, Ahmed, thank, thank you for that. I want to turn just really quickly on this issue um, to Dana Abdelaziz from uh, United Stateless, who's joining us from the United States, I hope, and ask about her perspective on how she sees the Kuwaiti situation unfolding and how that has an impact on her there. I mean, we'll come back to Donna, Donna later, of course, but I just, I just want to get your sense now on the basis of what you've heard so far. What is your sense about you know, we heard of Batu talking about the, 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 the issues of patriarchy. Um, uh, 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 Ahmed talked about the legal position, legal, legal active. Is there some sense that you have over in New York of a Badoon, of a Badoon heritage that, 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 that strikes a chord with you? How do you see it from there? Well, the issue with the Bidun in, in, the, in the United States is that even though they're they trying to seek to adjust their status, they're having a huge issue with the Kuwaiti embassy. The Kuwaiti embassy is not, they're refusing to give them any legal paperwork stating either they are from there or they're not from there. And it's a huge problem to their case. They're being hanged over over here, sent to detentions and being released and being under supervision. And it's like they stuck in dilemma. They can't travel back and they can't adjust their status over here. And the embassy is not willing to do anything. Okay. Even, even, with, even with their mother as a Kuwaiti citizen, it's difficult for them to get any type of paperwork. Okay, it's, it's from from those few comments. It sounds like actually what you're really struggling with is a much more immediate situation of 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 the predicament that you're facing in the United States. Oh yes. Okay, Hadil, can you can you hear me? Can you are you are you back with us? It sounds it, it sounds like she's not. I want to come then to uh, if 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 it's okay. Um, one of the people um, who's 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 written in on the on the YouTube as was asking about um, asking about what happened during the COVID uh, pandemic, which of which we're still uh, in. 
is there anybody who is on the line at the minute who can can address that question? Maybe Nasser Al Anisi or, uh, or 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 somebody who who who's more familiar with how the COVID situation is unfolding uh, amongst the stateless community in in in, uh, in Kuwait. It's an open question. If Batul, uh, uh, Hakim, even Ahmed in London, or or Hadil uh, in Kuwait, if if you want to address it, by all means, please do so. Hello. Hi, Ahmed. Did, have you got a sense of how how things? and has affected the state uh, so, sorry Drew Ray, I lost you for uh, seconds I, I think you're talking about the impact of uh, uh, the pandemic circumstances on, on the Bedouin in Kuwait right that's right. That's right. I just want to ask if, if there's a, one of the questions in the YouTube space did relate to to that issue. And I just wonder if um, um, so Jen, it's an open question, really, if somebody could comment on that. Yeah, I, I see. I, I'll, I'll tell you that what, what happened to my own family and it reflects the, the what is happening to the majority of the Bedouin in Kuwait. Uh, I have I have my my family, my brother being you know kicked out from their jobs uh, basically they used to work very basic jobs you know and very tentative but now they are without salaries at the same time the family has to pay for rent the landlord will never you know have any uh, any sympathy with them i also have my handicapped brother uh, because of the pandemic you know uh, covid-19 and all these things he he requires special needs and he has been there in the hospital now for six months the family uh, uh, he's stranded in the hospital actually in the psychiatric hospital because uh, 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 the, the, there is no place for him in special needs you know hospitals or organizations so instead the ministry of psychiatric hospital and this has affected his uh, health very badly you know so we have we have people without salaries are asked by by, and threatened by landlord to be sent to court or jail or, or, or be in the street, kicked out. We have people, pe people not working. We have people are unable to, to uh, uh, have the basics uh, to survive. You know, some people even are struggling, not my family, but some other families are struggling with even food, you know. And, uh, and for some females, I heard stories that they don't have access to uh, sanitary uh, 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 pr uh, products, you know, which is a basic thing. And this this has right. also been by some social media. From, from what you have heard yourself, uh, Ahmed, about, for example, you talked about uh, lack of food. Are you aware of individual cases of the Bedouin community in a country so, so rich where... Uh, where, 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 as you know, indigenous um, stateless people during the pandemic. Yes, yes, I knew, I knew of people who were begging money to to buy, uh, uh, and they're 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 youth, you know, and men, and yeah, they, they, who were who were begging five kd, and and this is one of my friends, and if you want in private, I can provide you with his details if he allows me to do that, you know. He is asking people for 5KD to buy food for his family because his mother, and this this is also, again, uh, you know, complicated. His mother is Egyptian and her residency expired and she's overage and all these things. And he doesn't work, doesn't have job. And he he was asking for 5KD money just to afford, afford food, you know. And, and it is documented. I have the correspondence uh, with me. And I have some, some testimonies also where, where some... Female Bedouin women, uh, female Bedouin were struggling with get, getting, you know, uh, you know, uh, products that that they couldn't afford to buy. Batul, 
but so you, I think you might have, have some experience about some of these sort of challenges relating to women in particular. What has been the impact that you're familiar with on women, stateless women, in the course of the pandemic? Um, what we were seeing, when I say we, like the Bedouin women community, that there's lack of access to hygienic products like uh, pads and all of that. So some women are using rice bags to substitute a sanitary pad. And I know this is too much information, but it is something that we need to see because it's ugly as it is. Say it, just say it, say it. It's important to be said. Yeah, they're just using pads as rice bags instead of just a normal pad. And it's outrageous because a lot of people got angry because this topic should not be talked about because God forbid a woman actually gets her period every month. That is not something that's okay. And this is something that we have to address because when, like me and my, like our whole community, like I heard from one of the people that were trying to help out our own community, she was telling me that while she was giving somebody like some of the groceries because we help out each other, when the woman saw a bag that had pads in it, she looked at my sister and she told her, thank you, you thought of me. So for us to see a pad and think that, oh, somebody remembered you because they got you a pad, that's outrageous. That's not okay. And this should not be a reality for a lot of women that can't talk about it because um, you, the main responsibilities are for the house, the food, the, the oil or all of that but never what a woman needs. For example, something very natural. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Thank that's you. awful. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. That's, that's, that's really awful. Um, I think we have Hadil back. Um, I'm hoping she's back. Hadil, can you nod if you can hear me at least, or even say yes? Yes, yeah. I'm here. Great, okay. I do. We, we don't have a huge amount of time left for, yeah. for this session. Um, we're going to wrap up um, in the next couple of minutes before we move to, to chamber. But I wanted to address a question. Uh, activism that we've been talking about has ranged international activism from the big organizations like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch to the kind of activism that uh, that Hakim uh, and and many have have been engaged in, Betul had had another form of activism in mind that spoke more to uh, a, maybe a non patriarchal or intersectional sense of patriarchy. Uh, sorry, intersectional activism. I wanted to ask you about your sense of of um, of what. The Kuwaiti population themselves do in their activism, or what the Badoon community themselves can do in terms of their activism to shape the narrative. And then we'll come back to some more questions before getting to you, Shema. Before getting to you. Okay. Um, after we worked on uh, the lawyers' uh, society law, which was almost six months. We have sensed that the power and the effort should come from the Bedouin themselves. Even if we as a Kuwaiti members community, we worked on this issue, we won't reach that level of power unless the Bedouin work on, the, on themselves. So um, as long as we are working on the, the case, Hakim and all the, our colleagues were working together with us because we cannot do this alone. Even if we believe deeply in their case, the change can come only from them, not from us. But what can we do to them to make their cases really high and to be seen in the Kuwaiti community? Uh, after, uh, as I said, after, after we work on the law, we make a, like um, comforting the, the parliament members with the law that will stop uh, Al Marzoub al Ghanim law. So, this is what we have worked on. We can stop things. We can work on uh, cases that could even make the national society look at the Bedouin case. But how can we start from the ground? 
um, the the Kuwaiti society, as Nawaf Al Hindal said, my colleague, he said that they are really separated and they, they feel like not reaching the the whole idea about the Bedouin. How do they live? How do they face what they are facing right now? Um, what we are working on right now is that on the new uh, as a new level of the election, which is coming. Um, uh, next month, we're trying to make the Kuwaiti society be aware of what if the Bedouin will stay Bedouin forever, what the children will face, what the women will face. After um, Khalid uh, mentioned, uh, or Ahmed, sorry, he mentioned about the pandemic. We have seen that uh, the the whole uh, the whole families were like looking and searching for aids and. This is this is really heartbreaking because nobody see them, nobody's helping them. So this is what we have to separate our work from being human rights activists or human rights defenders to be human right, humanitarian. We have to work on both sides in this uh, in this case or in this um, the whole dilemma thing. So how can we affect? How can we change? We have to work together either the organizations, NGOs here in Kuwait, or the, 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 the whole society should work on to shift the, the, whole, the whole story of the Bedouin. We have to shift it right now because it, it took a long time. And uh, like I joined this activism like 11 years from now. And um, I didn't see that big shift that comes to end the case of Bedouin. And I'm hoping that the coming uh, or the next elections, we can we can change a lot by uh, lobbying and talking to uh, to the upcoming uh, parliament members to know and to be aware. And if they didn't work with us, we will stop right now and try to shift another line of activism because what we are working on right now is um, shifting another line of activism to work on human rights because this is our own weapon. We can say. Shuri, are you there? I I've got some some connection problems myself. Um, yeah. Look, I I just want to if you can hear me, um, I just want to draw attention to comments made by um, an activist in Kuwait, uh, uh, Fires and. Fires, he's talking about, uh, perhaps those who are, who are monitoring the YouTube space can see it, that uh, during the pandemic, Badoon uh, uh, residents, Kuwaitis who are stateless, have been denied flu jabs, uh, which have apparently been uh, limited to, uh, to Kuwaiti citizens. And indeed, there's been a problem in relation to, to a lack of work and dependence on, on freelance, uh, freelance work. Look, uh, I also want to thank Khush Alam uh, for his comments in the YouTube in the YouTube space as well. Before I go to Shema, um, I just want to go back to Hakim and Mohammed Salem for really just like two minutes because we're running behind a schedule now. So Hakim, if you can get Mohammed Salem with you, um, and if ideally if he's able to speak in English because some of us uh, don't speak Arabic as well as we would like to. Um, and to ask Mohammed uh, for his assessment of the, 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 the legal situation, the government law and indeed the, the civil society law, the law proposed by the Kuwaiti Bar Association, so, so Hakim, uh, Abdul Hakim, if you're able to put Mohammed Salem online just for a couple of minutes, um, I would be really grateful. And then, and then we are going to have to move to to Shema. Yes. Hi. How can uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for this session. Uh, actually, uh, if you are asking about the 
the act is the activism or the route to uh, citizenship if it can be achieved through activism and i have here thoughts about uh, soft activism uh, versus hard activism uh, actually we have uh, both routes running on the same time uh, but we have uh, a big issue that we don't have the legal uh, framework to uh, to convey the ideas or to convince the government uh, on the on the best practices. Uh, actually, during since 2012, UNHCR have uh, intervened uh, away from the media, of course. Uh, to try to convince the governments of the GCC of a few uh, best practices in uh, uh, in addressing the stateless issue. Uh, that uh, didn't prove beneficiary and they didn't uh, pursue this route. Uh, what we feel now is that we, we need to address the cultural aspect and the political aspect at the same time. Uh, you can say that in Kuwait, uh, people in Arabic can understand what is the difference between uh, a citizen uh, and an expat, uh, and, uh, an immigrant, uh, an immigrant worker. Uh, but they don't understand the aspect of uh, a national, a Kuwaiti national, and a Kuwaiti citizen. Uh, going back de to the Constitutional Assembly, the first entity to, to draw the Kuwaiti constitution, uh, they addressed the issue of Kuwaiti nationals who did not obtain the Kuwaiti citizenship yet. Uh, they were demolishing uh, small villages in Availia and in uh, Jalib Shouk, uh, and they were trying to compensate the owners of these uh, houses or their uh, small houses. Uh, and the Constitutional Assembly had uh, a note that some of these people are not yet Kuwaiti nationals, uh, Kuwaiti citizens. So uh, they approved that there were. Uh, Kuwaitis, uh, stateless Kuwaitis. Uh, this thing is not uh, recurrent or focused on uh, on the legal uh, uh, run of the Kuwaiti uh, citizenship law. The first draft and the first applied Kuwaiti citizenship law was uh, fair enough. Uh, it had uh, so many paths to uh, filling the river of citizenship. But within the course of 50 or 50 years, there has been more than 14 amendments on the law. And all, most of them, uh, to be uh, accurate, most of those amendments were, were uh, to detach people of citizenship, not to include people, not inclusive, not to include people into citizenship. Okay, to stop them from having access to citizenship. That course is running and is still running through the bill that has been drafted by uh, the Speaker of the Parliament. <sighs> To understand this mentality, you have to go back to the social uh, build of the Kuwaiti society. Uh, we understand now it's a rentier capitalism, but it was built uh, basically on a feudal uh, egalitarian uh, or ancient regime where the, the mercantile were uh, paying uh, taxes to the government uh, holding all the, 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 the private entities uh, and the ruling family was just uh, uh, handling the uh, governmental or uh, legislative issues. Uh, this is a stalemate. To, to say that we have uh, an opening or a, a light at the end of the tunnel uh, between this power struggle between the government and 
the, 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 the people of Kuwait, uh, the parliament and the, the, the government, uh, it's just a stalemate, will not reach anywhere. Uh, that's why some of the activists in Kuwait have uh, suggested uh, the tripartism uh, uh, corporation uh, that the the stateless uh, people should uh, be part in the solution or the remedy that has the uh, that will be drafted, uh, the NGOs at the same time, uh, and the international community, whether if it is. Uh, UNHCR or UNDP or UN Women, uh, they can provide the uh, legislative frame uh, that uh, helps the government to comply with its uh, international obligations and the government uh, to uh, to provide all the files, uh, all the documents. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Mohammed, uh, provide sorry, the resources. Mohammed, sorry to interrupt. I I, yes. I I would really like to just to. We can come back to have a. We're running a little bit behind schedule now, and I, I want to finish on that last point that you made, which is that unity or the idea or the 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 objective of unity between the stateless uh, community, between the NGOs and the international community. I'd like you to hold that thought, keep that in your mind, um, while we when we come to the general conversation later with. Devin, with Tara Separifar, with Catherine Harrington, which I hope is here, with Dana in, in, uh, and, and others at the towards the end of the session, because I, I think that's a, a very strong point. Okay. Um, Great. Thank you very, very much for, for that intervention. Thank Shema, you. if you can hear me, we're running a little bit uh, behind schedule, everyone, so I'm really sorry about that. Shema is a is a Kuwaiti uh, national. She is studying in, uh, in 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 Ireland and working on how these cases are being handled by the the international um, um, asylum system. So Shema, if you're able to to join us, can you just tell us a little bit about about what you've been working on? Um, yeah, can you hear me, first of all? Yeah. Okay. So, um, is my screen also shared? Because <laughs> I need to. Okay. I'm seeing. Uh, yes. Great. Okay. I'm. I'm certainly seeing it. I hope others can too. Okay. So, um, my topic is a bit different, though. It focuses on Kuwait. It also kind of um, takes a, um, some jobs at the UK. Um, so it talks about uh, the regularization of the individual according to status conceptions in an act to regularize the state itself. Um, but first of all, I would like to talk about the state, which is in itself a very old concept in the Westphalian sense, but it's really developed more recently in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and national consciousness in itself has always been something that was there prior to the definition and creation of the strict borders of the state. Um, and this process in itself is, though the processes of border formation have been affected by national consciousness, there really is no more um, better way to validate the state and to instate its sovereignty following the trend of politics than with the existence of having nationals. And on that regard, in that regards, you would also have the non-national. Um, to further make the system seem more regular and also to use it as a coercive tool. Um, and right now, it is a highly surveilled world. I'm pretty sure those of you living in London know how many cameras there are out there taking pictures of you. Um, so to possess these documents of identification is to possess this position of being normal or of being regular. Um, and so this, again, doesn't just make the citizen regular, but makes in our consciousness the idea of a state seem as something regular. Um, the non-national in this regards would be needed not only to show us where the boundary of national consciousness lies, but also in discussions of the individual's legality and the access to rights that should be available. Uh, this all follows the motif of the national being the rights holder and the state being the nation's provider, uh, the, the rights provider. And of course, we are all well aware of the fluctuation of rights between their proposed human element 
to their actual sedentary location in the camp of the national. It's never really an issue of human rights. It's more so um, an issue of a national's right. So for the normal asylum seeker, you know, as normal as asylum can get, fleeing a situation of persecution, identity documents are um, a privilege to possess. However, they perform the role of a burden for the Bedouin who crosses national borders to claim asylum abroad. Um, the processes of persecution are adopted elsewhere, and it's not only capitalism here that's benefiting from globalization, but state supremacy and its extreme political pervasiveness is also intermingling and coloring international human rights law in that regard. The United Kingdom offers an interesting case study, firstly, because of its historical ties to the Middle East and its first-hand experience in aiding and abetting the formation of these new nation clusters. It wasn't too long ago that the several nationalisms across the Middle East themselves were thorns in the side of the British Empire. And though it is a strong allyship today, we can't deny that the initial uh, formative act of separation was a begrudging way to start the relationship. But, you know, currently we still have Britain haunting the Middle East. Uh, the spirit of this relationship, of course, currently manifests itself in several positive different ways, one of them being uh, Kuwait's heavy investments in the UK, including business initiatives, as well as in the UK's government bonds. Secondly, as a result of the nature of their relationship, there is this active collaboration between the UK Home Office and Kuwaiti officials in decision making of who these stateless applicants really are. So this is where mutual complicity is at play and where we could actually finally answer the question of what's in it for the UK. We recently see this in 2014 and in 2015 when the Kuwaiti Ministry of Interior's Assist Assistant Undersecretary for Citizenship and Residency Affairs, Major General Mazen Jarrah Subah, offered a key role in aiding British authorities in their attempts to identify and validate the claims of the truly persecuted Bedouin. And in the eyes of the government, documented Bedouin were regularized, if not as a national of the state of Kuwait, but as a national of any other state that they are constructed to be a national of, whether they like it or not. Um, the term stateless itself does not accu accurately capture the conceptual quality the group holds. The Bedouin are not Bedouin in Kuwait, nor are they stateless. They do have a state, or they might as well adopt or perform a certain national identity through other naturalization processes, so long as that process is in Kuwaiti. And that is why they're conceived by Kuwait to be illegal residents, and it is not just one way to enforce the complementary binaries of lawful, unlawful, and good, bad, but on the international level is also another way to cast doubt on their entitlement of nationality. Uh, for the Bedouin, the crux of the problem was never about lacking a nationality, but lacking their Kuwaiti nationality. And this deliberate conflation by the government with continued reproductions abroad unmistakably serves to muddle efforts at invoking international human rights conventions with regards to the right of nationality. Risk of persecution is a phrase favored by asylum granting countries to. Carry on. Carry yeah. Sorry. Did you need something, Drury? Okay, I'll just continue talking for now. informs the rejected asylum. Oh, wait, can you guys hear me? Should I hear yes, it? I can. <laughs> I can hear it. Sorry, I, th I thought I was talking to myself, which is something I normally enjoy, but um, yeah, so in this, yeah, with this regards, um, because they don't 
suffer persecution, according to UK and Kuwait. This often leads to the rejected asylum application, which would then um, mostly lead to a breach of the international principle of non-reforma, especially in a case where re-entry to the home state is all but guaranteed, facilitating the rejection process for the host country even further. And this was... Uh, mm. I'm not sure, actually. It, it does look that way, Shema. It does look that oh, way. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm oh, seeing oh. mostly me. Can you see, can you guys see the screen now? Okay. 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 Great. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I worked really hard on the PowerPoint. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so carry on. Carry on. So this was certainly the plan that was in the works between Kuwait and the UK. Both had ended up reaching a deal to repatriate the Bedouin applicants whose asylum claims of statelessness were rejected by the UK. But if anything, really, all of this hubbub really just harkens back to the original conception, which is the need to regularize and not regularize to confirm sovereignty. Interestingly, both the UK and Kuwait do not offer to repatriate the Bedouin to the alleged home countries listed in their documentation. Kuwait's borders are surprisingly open wide for a social category that it continuously criminalizes and cites as a security threat. And the UK Home Office, accepting that these applicants have some secret hidden nationality, are not stateless, questions nothing of Kuwait's actions or its own. The UK Home Office as well made no move to review any information it gathered from its consultations with General Mazen al-Jarrah on his take on the authenticity of the Bedouin applicants. Currently, the general himself is implicated in Kuwait for aiding in visa forgery. A development of events, though very ironic, are not really unusual performance on the stage that has been set thus far. And yeah, thank you. Thanks. Turn to uh, Andreas Bjorklund, who is a uh, doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford. And he has been working on a typology of Badoon asylum seekers in, um, in Europe. Um, Andreas, if you can hear us, will you tell us a little bit what you have been working on? Great. Glad to see the technology works. Or at least seems to work. Yeah. Maybe you need to Andres, call him. I think you have to unmute yourself. Oh, that's a classic. That always happens to other people, and now it happened to me too. Andreas, yeah. if you can hear us, please unmute. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I suppose I want to pick up from Shema's talk after she helpfully provided some theoretical background. Um, today, yeah, so I want to talk a bit about Bidun asylum seekers in Europe and how they have been divided into two groups, those eligible and those ineligible for refugee status. Let me start by briefly putting the Bidun refugee situation into context. Um, Bidun seek asylum because they fear persecution or serious harm in Kuwait on the basis of their identity as Bidun. This can be grounds for refugee status is under the 1951 UN Refugee Convention. Now, some countries offer, offer Bidun alternative protection, such as on humanitarian grounds, but this is different from refugee status, so I'll, I'll stick with asylum and, and refugee status right now. Um, countries have their own policies about how to examine uh, if a person can be considered a ref refugee or not, and given our short time here, I thought it best to focus on one country, the UK. Uh, which actually has developed quite an intricate system how to process asylum claims by Kuwaiti Bidun. Also, what's happened in the UK has actually been very influential in the rest of Europe uh, with regards to Bidun asylum determinations. So the UK's process concerning the Bidun is essentially built on three so-called country guidance cases from British asylum tribunals. So tribunals are like courts, kind of, are where the asylum seekers, of course, have uh, can appeal any rejections to, to, to their asylum claims and decisions on their asylum claims. The point of country guidance cases is to basically um, be a, 
uh, guidelines for making any future asylum de decisions from Kuwait. The first country guidance case came in 2004 when two Bedouin men appealed their rejected asylum decisions. So for this case, there's two important things I think it's worth spending some time talking about. Uh, it might get a little technical at times. It's not so easy to summarize uh, legal cases, but bear with me and I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, the first major issue uh, the judges in the case from 2004 considered re regarded deportability. So the process in which somebody becomes, becomes possible to deport somebody from the country in which they're staying. A central problem was that the Bidu not only claimed that they could not go back to Kuwait because they were being persecuted, but also because they literally wouldn't be let back in. So the British judges discussed this at some length. There was a case in New Zealand in which a Bidun man had been reject, rejected, partly on the basis that Kuwait would not accept him to re-enter the country. This meant, according to the New Zealand judge, that there was no well-founded fear of persecution because the man couldn't be let back in to be persecuted in the first place. So this all sounds very bizarre, but this was, there was a lot of discussion, legal discussion spent on this issue. And the British judges, in the end, argued that um, yeah, they, they really wanted to examine: Could you? Sh how much? Sh how much? Uh, what, what should we make of the relationship between refugee status on one hand and whether somebody can be returned to their country of origin or not? They ultimately argued that discussing hypothetical returns to Kuwait involved way too much speculation. How would they be let in? Nobody really knew. So for this reason, the judge decided that the Bedouin asylum seekers that they were reviewing were undocumented Bedouin. Uh, because they did not have the papers required that might allow them to enter Kuwait. So this brings up brings us to the second important point from this case, namely that the Bedouin were now divided into two groups, the documented on the one hand and the undocumented on the other. And to make this distinction, the judges then had to look at what was going on in Kuwait. And so they referred to what's called objective country material, which is typically human rights reports, um, expert testimony, um, uh, and both lawyers, both from the both from the asylum seekers and from the the Home Office, uh, bring these uh, material before the judges. So, studying this material, the judges found that the denial of nationality itself, the denial of citizenship itself, did not amount to persecution in, in the international law. Um, instead, what mattered was the practical consequences of being denied citizenship, because without papers, you wouldn't be able to access a range of social, economic, and political rights. So it was really the lack of documents that was creating persecution, the judges argued. So, but who was documented and who wasn't? In studying the situation in Kuwait, the judges found that there seemed to be two groups of Bedouin. One group had registered with the with what they called the Bedouin Committee between 1996 and 2000, the Lajnat um, and they had ob obtained so-called civil identification documents. The other group consisted of those who had not obtained those same documents. So crucially, the judges said, well, actually, we think the majority of the Bedouin in Kuwait, some 80,000 out of 120,000, they're undocumented. Basically, this means that the majority of the Bedouin in Kuwait are experiencing persecution. And in the end, the judges uh, approved the appeal. So in a way, there was actually a positive outcome for the Bedouin asylum seekers in the short term. But as we will see in the long term, this often would place future Bedouin asylum seekers in nearly an impossible situation in which they had to prove that they were undocumented. So there were two more country guidance cases in the UK, and I, I won't spend much time discussing them because I think the main issue that they really contributed to was this idea what were these crucial documents that Bidun might have that would make them ineligible for asylum. The first country case, well, they didn't really provide very clear answers to this. They said that maybe if they have residence permits or some other official papers, they're documented. But what certainly doesn't count is having the review card from the from the Bidun committee or the so-called Betaka Maraja in Arabic. This is basically the card that was given by the Kuwaiti authority that was um, registering Bedouin in the late 1990s. They, the judges in that case said, no, this card is, because it's not, because it says on the card, literally, this card is not considered proof of personal identity, it can hardly be uh, making somebody a uh, documented person. However, a few years later, in the latest country guided case, the judges argued the opposite. Now, the review card from the new Bedouin committee, which had recently been founded, was actually what identified somebody as a documented Bedouin. If you had a valid review card, a valid Bataka Maraja, that was what made you a documented Bedouin, because then you had access to all these services that you that undocumented Bedouin were being deprived of. So in this way, of what was documented had changed in a 10-year period, because lots of people have those cards. 
even if they might not be valid at the same time. However, both um, of the both the country guidance cases um, of 2006 and 2013, so the two later country guidance cases, they found that the situation in Kuwait basically hadn't changed so much in terms of who was being persecuted and who wasn't. The documented Badoon were still being discriminated, but they weren't, that wasn't up until the point of persecution. And the judges spent some time defining why they thought that wasn't the case. Whereas the undocumented Badoon were still being persecuted. And so the judges really placed emphasis on the fact that it looks like some positive steps are being taken in Kuwait and there's registrations, there have been some legal measures being taken. We think this could be better. So we, we're not going to count uh, being documented as uh, that doesn't amount to persecution. These conclusions, if you read the evidence that they use to make these claims, I think is quite surprising. Um, that is, if you read the human rights reports that were discussed in the case, I don't think they clearly support the conclusion that carrying a security card necessarily prevented a Bedouin from experiencing persecution. But now a legal distinction had been made. Uh, and this is how uh, Bedouin cases in the UK and in Europe really have been determined since. Um, in general, the judges seem to permit a high level of tolerance for systematic discrimination and denial of human rights without labeling it persecution. So what can we conclude from all this? I think that dividing the Bedouin into two groups seems to be quite inconsistent, even within the legal discussions of how they have been viewed in British asylum case law. In the original country guidance case, back from 2004, the judges strongly argued that the Bedouin were a particular social group. Uh, a particular social group is something that's defined in the 1951 Refugee Convention. And the judges said, it's one of those cases in which you might be experiencing persecu persecution if you belong to one. The judges said that, and I quote now, that we do have an extended tribal identity and so cannot be reduced to persons simply by their statelessness. That is sufficient in our view to bring them within the meaning of the term race, as also employed in the 1951 Refugee Convention, end quote. So in other words, the Bedouin's tribal background and identity, as the judge put it, it had mattered. But 10 years later, the tribal background no longer mattered, because now, in the latest country guidance case, the judges argue that there is no evidence that the Bedouin, and I quote, in order to avoid persecution and un unhuman and or degrading treatments, have to deny who they are. That is to say, their race and or their Kuwaiti nationality or their particular social group. In contrast, it seems clear that many Bedouin actively seek to establish or to have accepted their Kuwaiti nationality, end quote. So, Moving away from a collective Bedouin experiencing and distinguishing them into two groups, um, depending on who faces the persecution and who doesn't, has serious consequences. For Bedouin asylum seekers, you're presented with a paradoxical situation. In order to prove your persecution, you should ideally have no documents, as the more documents they have, the more likely you are to be suspected of being a documented Bedouin. It's, of course, very difficult to prove that you don't have documents, and it's met with suspicion. How did you manage to survive it all in Kuwait with no documents? How did you rent a house? How did your kids go to school? How did you pay for the, your journey to Europe? This is a common reason why Bedouin asylum seekers are rejected, leaving them without legal status in Europe. It also leaves them deportable in the legal sense, but undeportable in the practical sense. This echoes also what Dan Abdelaziz said a bit earlier uh, on this call. If, if, if a Bedouin asylum decision is rejected, if it's a negative asylum decision, then they should according at least to the asylum system, returned to their home country. But stateless persons without documents cannot easily be returned to their home country, especially if the receiving country doesn't want to let them in in the first place. So I'll end on this. What all this amounts to is that Bedouin asylum seekers' experience in Europe resonates to some degree to what, with their situation in Kuwait. They live for many years a precarious in limbo, without a regularized status, and without significant, with significant limitations to being able to live a decent life. So thanks. Thanks, Andreas and Shema. Look, for those of you who may not understand or appreciate this perspective, it, it's simple. The decisions made within Kuwait relevant to a population that lives there has caused those people to leave the country and go elsewhere. On this call alone, on this seminar alone, Dana uh, is in the United States. There are countless others, it was mentioned in the, in the film as well, who are also abroad. Decisions made in Kuwait 
by the Kuwaiti authorities matter. Right before we move to the uh, the launch of the Anna Kuwaiti website and indeed the Twitter. Uh, account by my colleague uh, Jawad Feruz. I just want to reference a couple of comments that have come in uh, that have been passed to me. Um, Michelle Al-Dafiri said, we want a radical solution to the Badoon issue. And uh, the Kuwait Badoon movement uh, really pointed out the problems of the of of this whole documented business about how, you know, what is the problem um, and this whole dichotomy or apparent dichotomy be between documented and undocumented, which I hope <coughs> I hope we'll, we'll get to a bit later on uh, to discuss that a little bit more. Um, thank you again, uh, Shema and, uh, and Andreas. We will come back to those issues when, uh, when we have the open, rather more general Discussion when we're going to turn to 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 Tara, to Devin, to Claire, to to others, um, when uh, when we have the general discussion. But part of the reason why we're meeting today is to launch a website and a social media account, which asserts a kind of indigeneity or or Kuwaitiness. My emphasis about this experience. And, and uh, my colleague Jawad Feruz and Nasara Aranisi, I hope will we'll now uh, talk about the launch of the, of the Anna Kuwaiti website. Jawad, I think you may be muted. Okay. Is this fine? Clear? Looks looks good, but all I see is a black screen. Ah, uh, why? Is it? I can see. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Drawery, for this introduction. And uh, I highly appreciate uh, all this uh, participation in this event. Um, uh, I want to indicate that the case of the Bedouin, unfortunately, still it is not taken enough momentum internationally. And uh, although we are here discussing about uh, thousands and thousands of people and such uh, atrocities is going on and all these, uh, um, let me say, uh, unlawful act uh, toward their living, toward their education, social life, and so on. And unfortunately, generation after generation are suffering of this case. So uh, part of the problem is it's not been well documented. Part of the uh, problem is that it's not been uh, utilized by UN mechanism in full scale. Part of the problem is that there is no enough references that we can uh, depend on to focus on this case. So for that all reasons, we thought about that it is time that we can be engaged, all concerned about this case, either activists in Kuwait or uh, certain elites who are uh, really uh, uh, have so much potential and efforts toward uh, um, finding the solution to this case. And at the same time, many international NGOs and so on. So to do so, we wanted for sure, first of all, to document the case. By documenting it, we should let all the victims, especially those who are in Kuwait, to be a little bit active and more active where they can document the issue. In the same time, they have to follow up certain mechanism which is adopted by the UN, utilizing human rights council sessions, utilizing different different types of the advocacies and the campaigns which is are uh, being now run by the international uh, uh, NGOs and so on. So all that's required a certain platform. It's required a certain website that we can have. Entire case could be found there. As we know, there are many books is being written. As we know, there are many articles being written. As we know, we have uh, yet uh, 
uh, some uh, reports has been written about it, but all scattered in different places. So our idea was Salam for Democracy and the Kuwaiti Community uh, Association, we joined efforted that we can have a website where we can have all whatever related to the issue of uh, Bidun in Kuwait, the sadness in Kuwait, to be posted there. And here we can find, uh, if we go through the, the menu, we can have some videos, we can have some articles, we can have some reports, statements, and so on. And all this will be updated on a regular basis. So we, first of all, encouraging all the victims to participate with us and forward their stories, the documentation of any type of atrocities that we can have it and then if possible we can make a story about it then publish it here or we can forward it to the UN bodies and make certain claims with, within certain uh, let me say uh, special rapporteurs of another uh, working group and so on and all this is required that we can depend on a certain uh, uh, reference for that one so here the website of Anakuwaiti, you can see it now, and uh, it is so easy, just you type as a one word, anakuwaiti.org, uh, you can see this site, and then you can navigate through different, different sections. And part of it, we wanted to have a Twitter account, where our Twitter account has the same name, Anakuwaiti, and we try as much as we can to uh, try to either tweet or to retweet whatever stories related to the uh, stateless in Kuwait and Bidun. And we recently launched it, less than 24 hours, we launched that uh, website, encouraging everyone to follow the site, and then he, they can um, <clears throat> assist us to, to forwarding their tweet to us, and then we can re retweet it and so on. And once again, part of our uh, aim and uh, objective is to widespread uh, all what we can toward international communities and to make everyone aware about what's going on in Kuwait related to Bidun. And uh, in, in this case, I'm encouraging as many uh, people, either the victims, activists, some elites, NGOs, to make follow to, to this account where we can hear to be in contact with them and carry on similar uh, campaigns. Definitely, what we started today is the beginning. It is like a project for us. It is not just one shot event. It's going to be a, a, a project that we're going to continue running it. Just we started and with all our efforts and whoever is assisting us, there are so many international NGOs and here I can name here ISI and uh, ENS who have been so supportive to us that they can um, uh, continue with us this long, long journey and at the same time some other international NGOs that been uh, co-sponsoring this event and definitely they're going to continue with us uh, such um, activities and campaigns in, in near future. So uh, here is the site and here is the uh, a Twitter account and for sure we want it to be rich and, and, and new and the same time updated. Uh, for example, today our colleague Andreas, he gave us a, a short brief about his report. His report shortly will be uh, posted in this website and in our social media accounts. In the same time, at the beginning of the, uh, uh, the this event, we broadcasted a short uh, uh, film, a documentary film, and that one too. After we finish the event, that will be broadcasted in this one, and so on. So we try to dig in whatever is being written about the Bidun in Kuwait, statements in Kuwait, definitely as much as we can, we try to, to uh, add it here and upload and then it will be available for everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, I think I can end up here. Communication problems at my end. I think you have wrapped up. Yes, I wrapped up. Okay, great. Done. great. Listen, Jawad, thank you very much. I, 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 as Jawad was saying, as I imagine he was saying, because I, I seem to lose him towards the end, what we will be trying to do, and I think what Jawad and our colleagues will be doing, 
is trying to post and 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 use the Anakawati resort uh, as a place to put the relevant reports, be it from you know the, the the human rights organizations who are here now, some of the academic stuff, uh, Andreas's um, 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 reports, the work that Shema has done. There's also the work of our friend uh, Ahmed Matar. Um, I'm sure we're going to place there the work that Hawiati, the Mina statelessness uh, group, has uh, has put out. Um, uh, the, the the questions and answers which I I've circulated to the participants of this event, but now it should be made more available. We are running a bit behind time, and a few of us have got uh, family um, considerations. Not least Claire Beaugrand. Claire Beaugrand is a uh, is an academic um, at Exeter University. She's written a book on the stateless um, in Kuwait, and uh, is called upon by experts and governments and so on to comment on this issue. Claire, if you're with us and can hear us, as indeed I hope you can, I would like to put a question to you as you as we get started and and then then just go on to ask you about your general take on this on what you've heard so far to the extent that you've not had any technical issues. My question is this. You're an academic. This community lived in Kuwait. We do in person. Coming from Saudi Arabia, as the government migration, or is there a sense? That that is, is there an indie about this community? Is there a sense of dichotomy, or is that just really a few cases? And uh, 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 thinking about that, how do you see this situation going forward? Um, sorry, that's a bit silly, but um. You've been completely cut during the question, so I heard Saudi Arabia and and going forward. I just um, I just don't want you to repeat if it doesn't work, but I just like um, maybe make. A few yeah, let, let me come make it really short. I'll make it really short if you can hear me. Yeah, is I can hear you if it's not cut. Is the question of the the state? people in Kuwait. Is it one of migration? That is to say, these are illegal migrants in this political space of Kuwait? Or are they an indigenous population that needs to be dealt with in some other way than what we have seen up to now? Is there a, is there a clear dichotomy about this? And if so, how do you unpack that? I mean, I replied to this by... Um... Well, first of all, saying thanks and and really here, um, um, as Batul and 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 the same as uh, Hadil as well. Um, I learned so much from how what's being done since I really handled the question, and I also am um, this old one. Batul mentioned. disinformation um, that actually you know this is um, Hakim said this is the um, political issue so this is really a fight uh, with um, with different means but the level of disinformation that actually um, the government of Kuwait has been uh, has been working with when I first really started with the issue the sort of perception internationally is that it was Iraqi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so little by little, we're getting there into how, um, you know, how this is, this is whole part of the, of the battle to refuse uh, this uh, citizenship. And I want to make some, just very few common. Yeah, I say Hakim said is a political issue and it is a political 
war. It's a political fight, you know, where the two sides have not really the same arms. Um, and um, the second thing about like really this kind of um, um, portraying and creating categories, etc. And the second remark that comes to my mind, looking at the the fat work being done by Shana and and Andreas, is the complicity of the former colonial power as well, uh, and also this very new problematic that we have. Um, is it just me that's having difficulty hearing Claire? I uh, should I stop? Yeah, well, I stopped. I stopped talking. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this is the second thing I wanted to say: the complexity the UK is having, and also almost. I just wonder this issue of documentation. If they were not um, uh, concomitant to the central apparatus, and as Hakim said as well, I think the central system is a bit um, has been exhausted. Is reserved and his, his kind of credibility, I, I, um, he has used every kind of um, techniques that really uh, made him a, an incredible, non-credible uh, organization. And the last very thing I wanted to say, really it's like part of it is remarks on what I've been um, heard in light of what I did 10 years ago, is this question of visibility and unvisibility. And I think here, uh, ironically, what Kuwait and the UK have been willing to hide actually comes now um, through, it will maybe become a question of public opinion in, in the West because now... Speaking on, and here there is also an opportunity because we know that government actually went public opinions are actually seizing uh, 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 the issue. So uh, I, I may um, stop here. I, uh, I'm not sure you've heard it all, but I hope you did. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Claire. I know, I, know, I know you've got other commitments now. Look, just one final question before you go. How do you see it from uh, either an academic position or otherwise? got an election coming up, a much disputed legal context. Where, where do you see it unfolding now? The, the, in, some people might say that the hand of the Kuwaitis is strong. That is to say the state is stronger than all of us put together. Mohammed Salem, the friend of Hakim's earlier, talked about a kind of tripartite agreement by the stateless community um, I'm just going to turn off my video just for a second um, by stateless community and and NGOs and uh, um, um, and the international community coming together. Um, well, thanks is, for the question. Is that question. an option? Would would that would that be more powerful than the Kuwaiti state? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Anyway, I uh, there is one remark I really wanted to make here, and um, this is also the passing of the Emir, uh, which hasn't been mentioned here, but uh, it was celebrated. Yeah. I mean, when I'm talking about the complicity, uh, it has been celebrated by, uh, remember, Emir of uh, um, the Humanity, which has always been like... Um, mm -hmm usually hypocrite, if not, if not more, uh, when we say the role that this actually, the higher uh, authority in the country, actually the one who will authorize, and, and I'm talking under control of, um, of Kuwaiti, uh, knowing low better than me. So um, there is this parliamentary election, but we know also that parliamentary election has been, um, I mean, parliamentarians have been sometimes doing their best, but also shown their limits provided there is no uh, sort of political okay from the top. I am a bit, um, I am a bit uh, skeptical about the, uh, the sort of um, new emir's will to change things, but let's see. But 
at least Subah was not helping, if I if I may. Um, so there is the parliament changing, but also there is this um, maybe at some point some change in the ruler, and we see somewhere else in the Gulf where a new generation rulers could do a completely like kind of a radical change in direction. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, uh, because I heard Saudi Arabia in your first question, um, mm. not so much about the idea of migration, because I think also, sorry, I wanted to say, I think this this is becoming a very important and his historical debate, but somehow what the new generation is doing is that it's, it, it has also become irrelevant now um, because um, the the inability of the central system to to prove anything, you know, uh, say, I, I think um, the transnational was before the nationals, as Ahmed say. But anyway, to come back to Saudi Arabia and, and my experience being like, um, anyway, having trouble in some other country is that the Bidun in Kuwait is something in the open. The Bidun everywhere else in the GCC is very problematic. And there will be pressure certainly uh, also on on Kuwait uh, with regard to this issue, and I'm I'm not sure about how the new uh, um, the new leaders will will resist to, the, to this pressure when we when we see what's happened um, somewhere somewhere else in the Gulf. Claire, thank you very much. If if you can stay with us, that would be great. Yeah, um, certainly. Uh, your 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 contribution is always always valued. I, I know that there's some people who uh, uh, who have taken uh, taken umbrage with what you've said and written before, but I you know I, I I'm I'm so pleased that you can be be with us um, amongst the pandemic and 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 uh, and and family commitments too. Um, look, I want to go. I'm going to come next. Going to go next to to Zahra, and also to Devon and to to Tara. Zahra uh, Al-Barazi is the co-director co of Hawiyati, which is the MENA stateless um, um, <coughs> group. That's maybe not, not, not the best word. The correspondent for MENA of what United Stateless is to the United States, and, and Dana will come to you later as well, and what, for example, uh, ENS, the European Network on Statelessness, is. Zahra, I hope you have not had the technical difficulties I've been having. I hope you've heard more or less what people have been saying. Um, I want to start off with actually a comment that Mohammed Salem, a colleague of, of Abdul Hakim's, was saying earlier about a kind of tripartite uh, coming together of, of the stateless community themselves. NGOs in Kuwait, maybe abroad as well, and some element of the international community, and put it to you whether that is the kind of thing that can 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 produce a momentum of change um, that can that can alter this situation, or do you see some other formula, or indeed what other kind of important features that you see in this problem? Yeah, um, thank you very much for this opportunity, first of all. I won't take up uh, too much time. Um, as you said, it's a privilege for us. Uh, uh, Hawiati, which, as you said, is going to bring together um, actors across the Middle East and North Africa, so not just Kuwait, who are interested in and working with statelessness together to try and address the issue, um, to be part of this conversation. Um, it is, on a more personal level, quite bad for me personally listening to this conversation. Um, I first went to Kuwait uh, looking at this issue in, back in 2011 and it's really quite difficult to see that in many aspects um, the situation has uh, got worse um, more than it's got better for a lot of people despite um, some of the amazing work that's being done. Um, but in terms of your question, I think uh, Absolutely. I, I, I don't think one form of advocacy um, is, you know, going uh, to, there's no hierarchy of advocacy. There needs to be a coming together of, of all different entities on this issue. Um, as Batul was saying, one of the most important things is that uh, the Badoon are very much a diverse group of people and kind of looking at them as this homogenous group first. For as NGOs and as NGOs and as states, etc., is problematic because they're a different way of doing things. 
Um, and at the same time, um, despite, I mean, I work with stateless communities across the world and just them being often one of the most active groups, uh, despite the persecution they face, um, there are huge policies, both from the Kuwait state and from other states, um, to try and divide. Um, you know, as we heard from Andrea, as, as we heard from Ahmad, who is asking us all to sort of challenge the divisions. So the importance of solidarity among the, you know, the stateless communities, among the Kuwaiti Badoons with other stateless communities, um, trying to get more solidarity despite the difference between the different entities. And as you, you know, your question asked, to try and form this kind of tripartite agreement. Uh, not good. Um, and I think now is an opportune time. I don't want to sound naive or too hopeful, but you know we, we've we've seen a very violent proposed law being addressed um, and you know being fought back by successfully by the lobbying of the Badoon and the activists. We have the election coming up. Uh, we have the passing of the Emir, and you know despite the power dynamics, things have been happening positively. Um, and with the more effort in terms of changing public perception uh, on the issue of the Badoon in the country, which may seem impossible, but you look at, you know, very kind of entrenched racist thoughts uh, about different communities across the world, it is possible to change the perception of the middle ground slowly but surely. Um, using some of the tools that the tool mentioned, such as um, storytelling and poetry and all sorts of different things. Um, so it is possible, and I think now is the opportune moment to as you asked, um, get people to work more in solidarity and in unity to address some of these issues. And how, just one quick question on that, how do you see that happening? happening? Do you see that coming from get-together um, afterwards offline and, and make joint appeals, or we go out and hold hands and dance through the streets? and say, uh, Kuwait, you really need to do something differently. How do you, how, the vision that Mohammed Salem sets out, that, that you're setting out, how do we do that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's, uh, I don't think there's one answer to that question. I think um, yeah. this conversation is one, you know, stone in a big uh, yeah. pool of stones of, of working together on this. Um, you know, people have given, Hawiti, for example, be a, uh, an option for people to try and share ideas and resource and support um, to try and work on this issue by connecting with different stateless groups across um, the region. Um, so, you know, be singing and dancing. I think a big effort needs to be put in kind of changing some of the perception, not of the hardcore right in Kuwait, but kind of the middle ground who don't really know perhaps what's happening. Um, that's something that, that really, and you know, building on what's already been done, look at the amazing stuff that's being done um, with regards to this new proposed law. Um, so making sure that, that we, especially who are more support when the Bajun communities themselves are leading uh, on this. Listen, thank you very much. I, 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 thanks for that. I mean, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of ideas coming from this. Um, Devin Kenny is uh, based in Beirut. He's the Kuwait and Gulf researcher for Amnesty International, obviously a, a big player in this issue. Um, Devin, you've hopefully heard some of what Zahra's had to say, what others have had to say, uh, maybe some element of even that uh, uh, some of the earlier conversations about Tul and Hakim and, and, uh, and Mohammed Salim. What role do you see Amnesty having in this in this uh, debate hi Drury uh, first things first just to make sure you can hear me yes we're good okay great um, I'm not going to be able to see you but that's fine yeah I'm not going to risk turning on my video it's been wonky with the video this whole call I don't want to okay. upset the delicate technological balance here um and yeah, just for a second point before I answer your question, just want to say that we've got a ton of people here who know a great deal um, about the Bidun issue and have a diversity of views. And it's uh, it's been quite nice for me to, to hear that. Um, some of you folks I've interacted with before professionally, but not all of you. Um, so I'm very keen to to continue uh, dialogue and, and to follow up with some of you. Um, 
and pick your brains and learn more about this because we've got a lot of uh, expertise on the subject here. Um, so, Drew, your question was, uh, what can Amnesty do to advance uh, international support of the Bidun's cause? Um, I was kind of giving this a bit of thought uh, in trying to prepare some remarks for this since the question is framed for this panel is what can be done at this stage. And I Sure, have, address it, address it. I just have a tentative tactical thought um, about this. So um, if we look at what just happened with the al Ghanim bill, um, it seems basically that it was defeated. And if you take that to be what happened, it was defeated almost entirely by domestic internal mobilization, I would say. Um, yes. It came and went so rapidly um, that there wasn't a great window, really, for a lot of international organizations, including Amnesty, because we're admittedly slow to even say anything before it had already um, been defeated by local Bidun lobbying efforts, um, which is great. I just wish we could have we could have acted quicker. Um, but so how could the international community help and how could Amnesty help? I mean, there there are these moments like the Al-Ghanim bill when uh, sort of a abrupt shift in policy in a very negative um, direction emerges. And provided that the window of opportunity to comment is more than a couple of days, as it was in this case, if it were a couple of weeks, then you would start hearing voices like amnesties and uh, UN human rights bodies speaking out on it. Um, and that's... We've, that's what groups like Amnesty and UN human rights bodies have traditionally done, which is good. Um, but I want to suggest that there may be actually be sort of um, an even an even greater threat here, um, which is so there's this Bahraini scholar named uh, Nora Lori um, who wrote a very good, very important book on the Emirati stateless, uh, basically the only work of its kind. It's called Offshore Citizens. And I was I was speaking to her, I've spoken to her directly, and I've read um, bits and bobs from her book as I can here and there. And one of the main themes of the book is just that the Emirati state has kept the, the stateless there um, in a state of perpetual limbo, uh, basically forever waiting on a final resolution of their uh, dilemma, which never comes. And when I spoke to uh, Nora, she she said that she was struck really powerfully in doing her background research by hearing a sort of similar narrative from uh, people in, of all places, the Brazilian poor, who similarly had issues with their national bureaucracy and basically just getting themselves recognized as people with the right to basic goods and services. And in that piece of literature she was looking at, someone made the comment that um, the waiting was really uh, the worst of all, the most painful and the most degrading and the most demoralizing ultimately, and that it might have been better simply to have a clean answer that, you know, no, you're, we're not going to recognize you have X, Y, or Z right, um, rather than going through years and then literally decades um, as the stateless have and as the Bidun and Kuwait have in a, in a situation of limbo. And that's hard to mobilize around, more so than these things like the al Ghanim bill um, that are sort of upsurges of aggressively bad policy that maybe uh, international organizations are a little bit better at swatting down to some extent. So how would one mobilize to, to actually fix the underlying problem, which is getting the Bidun nationality and ending the state of long-term limbo, even if it's not coming to some sort of crux or dramatic moment? And this is the this, this is the tactical thought that came to me. Um, the most powerful international actors that could affect Kuwait um, that are capable of being shamed at all. I'm excluding like Saudi Arabia because clearly they have influence. But um, <laughs> I don't know how we're going to get Saudi Arabia to care about anything. But like Kuwait's powerful Western allies, obviously the UK and the US. Um, they don't really view Kuwait as a problematic uh, state. Uh, in the regional context and its foreign policy, Kuwait's uh, regarded as a pretty s simple, easy to deal with state in the region. It's moderate on the GCC conflict with Qatar, which the US and the UK would like to see resolved. It's played a mediatory role in that. 
It's been very non-extremist and also interested in offering mediation in the Yemen war, which has uh, kind of become a problematic can of worms for uh, the aggressive Gulf states and their Western allies. Um, and the best way to to lobby and to get to get a powerful ally to bring pressure is to make the powerful ally see the state that needs to be pressured, see it as a state that's causing problems for them. So I would argue that in a way what Kuwait's doing actually is creating a rather big problem that could, the organizations like Amnesty could push um, Western governments to recognize, uh, which is that they're, they're essentially trying to fob off a portion of their population, uh, anywhere from seven to thirty percent, roughly, depend on depending on what estimates you you think are most reliable of the number of Bedouin in the population. They're just trying to fob them off on somewhere else uh, in the international community. And in the most recent uh, mutation of this, they've started actually assigning nationalities to people who are Kuwaiti. Um, which is completely insane from the perspective of international law. It's it's totally criminal and is totally disruptive to the fabric of the way things are supposed to work to just take a person who is your charge as a state and say, actually, you're Iraq's responsibility or you're Syria's responsibility or you're Iran's responsibility. Um, the extent to which this is crazy and disruptive and way outside of international norms maybe hasn't been recognized so far because Kuwait's mostly been assigning the Bedouin nationalities of states like Iraq that are, uh, you know, basically just in an internal mess right now, uh, or Iran that the, the West doesn't care about. But over the long run, this is hugely problematic. Um, it's totally disruptive. Yeah, Devin. Yeah, Devin. Please, please come come quick to the a bit quicker to the point, if you would. That's, that's the end of the point, is that uh, okay. this should be hammered home to Kuwait's allies. Okay, so you're uh, boiling it down to a line, if I've understood correctly, is that the path that they're on is a, uh, for want of a better term, a destructive one, and that our role in, in the kind of model that Mohammed Salem had talked about and some of the issues and the campaigning strategies that Betul, Zahra, and others have referred to <laughs> is for us to come together and show them the error of their ways. To show the allies the ways in which yeah, Kuwait's behavior is problematic in ways that will bite them in the ass as well. Okay. Um, Devin, stay on the line if you would. Tara, are you still with us uh, in Mexico City or have the allures of Mexico City taken you? No, you're great. You're, you're there. Fantastic. OK, Tara, you of a you represent another mainly U.S. based and a quite formidable human rights organization akin to Amnesty International in that way. Different, slightly different model. How do you see this playing out and what have you taken away from what the discussion has been tonight? Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. First of all, thank you so much for organizing this opportunity. I think, um, if nothing, um, the opportunity to hear each other and, and talk about the different aspects um, of the issue as well as different perspectives and different actors that are needed to address this issue has been very helpful. Um, and I can only echo Devin's um, sentiment of... Um, how useful it has been to hear different activists, some of whom I've met before and some we've corresponded. Um, in terms of thinking about how this partnership um, could could look, I think the way I would look at it is is figuring out how the uh, how how they could com complement each other or reinforce um, certain um, issues that could be mutually um, achieved. Um, and if I want to give an example, <clears throat> it's that in various issues, international human rights organizations might be ahead in terms of their ask. For example, the issue of women's rights on the ground. Um, often activists are trying to achieve a step-by-step -step change, while when we come in, we look at the law that has been passed to protect women against domestic violence, and we all often find issues with it and want to push it forward. In an issue like the issue of the, the Bedouin community in Kuwait, which 
as we all agree, the statelessness is the core of the issue and the path to nationality is the one that will solve the problem ultimately. <clears throat> Many of the activists might actually be ahead of some of the international organizations in how they're driving the agenda, how they're driving the argument. For example, the very useful conversation we had about um, taking the narrative back from the government, just changing the landscape of um, illegal residents versus stateless community. <clears throat> that is the work that is best done by activists on the ground and by academics, not necessarily INGOs or human rights NGOs. Where we're, where we're useful and where we can push is how we could formulate um, this issue through concrete human rights recommendations that then could be fed to Kuwait international allies or be pressured directly um, on the Kuwaiti state because um, unlike many other states in the region, Kuwait still allows international organizations to operate and, and pressure. But in order to formulate these issues as a roadmap um, that ultimately serves the main goal, there needs to be more collaboration and more understanding of this complementary role that where we could fit in, um, if that makes any sense. Look, I, I, I want to challenge you and Devin on, on, on one thing in particular, and, and it's just that you know, re re repeated human rights recommendations to the Kuwaiti state, even if they're one that does listen to us and does meet with us. You know, when I was there in 2013 or whenever it was, we actually managed to meet the, the prime minister and the human rights ministry and so on. Yeah, they do meet with us. That's fine. But they still don't change. Devin talked about how this uh, and, um, and by the way, Hakim and uh, Mohammed Salim and Batul and Hadil, I'm going to come back to you. Oh, even though we're over time, we're going to wrap up pretty, pretty soon. Um, he talked about how the overturning of this attempt to, uh, to pass this iniquitous legislation came indigenously, came from the local community. Do you see a role for Human Rights Watch in somehow supporting that community, adding to their voice, supporting their voice, and if so, how? Absolutely. And the way, um, so just to say how we would approach the same issues differently, that will serve the same goal. Uh, Hakim talked about uh, the very problematic nature of the central agency and the fact mm. that it needs to be gone. The way I would frame it based on the research we did in uh, February 2018 when we were on the ground and spoke to many of the activists, we did instead of saying that we do not recognize this procedure, we engaged with it and studied the way it was handling the, the ID card issues. What we found was that the process was completely opaque. Um, the yeah. assigning nationality had no merit whatsoever in any transparent way. And, uh, and more importantly, they lacked any sort of judicial review, the power of nationality. So that would be the way we would approach the issue of why this agency has been uh, one of the core elements of abuse against the Bedouin. Um, um, so, so absolutely there is a role, but the language might be different. Uh, but if we are, we understand each other's perspective and the language, then it can, uh, it can reinforce that, reinforce a, a solution that will benefit the community. Okay, listen. Thanks for that. I we're we, we're 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 hugely over time, uh, Tara, Devin, and everyone else. I and I do want to get, come back to our Badoon, our stateless friends at the end. Um, but before that, I want to turn to uh, Dana in New York, who is an American uh, Badoon, if I can put it that way, um, and ask for her take on 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 the situation. Um, on the basis of everything that 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 you've heard about the advocacy and so on, that that does it inform or shape how how you want to do things in the United States or any campaigning or what Human Rights Watch is doing? Um, uh, Dana, if you're there, can you can you join us? Sounds like Dana. Dana is there? Is not there? Some sound is there. Okay, Dana, if you're not there, um, Ahmed Matar, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Jabber, are you there? And Hakim and, and Batul, are you still around? Yes, 
Yes, I'm there. First to speak, I want to. I, we're, we're, we are really at the tail end of our of our meeting now. Um, we are now exactly half an hour overdue. Uh, we've gone too far. Betul, you're there. Great. Um, I'm going to come to you in a second. Hakim, if you're there, just just let me know. Uh, meanwhile, Ahmed, look, He's you've heard a out. lot. Of, I'm there. Yes. Great, great, great. Yes. Hakim's there too. You've heard a lot of discussions. Devin is talking about. Um, Devin has talked about uh, about showing the the error of the Kuwaiti state's ways. Uh, Tara talked about showing the how the, the how the the, 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 the the conduct of the authorities uh, violates human rights uh, standards and norms, and yet it's still a place that that is pretty freely and, and willingly abusing and ignoring those human rights recommendations. Uh, Betul talked about other forms of, of activism and so on. Look, what are your? Are there any other thoughts you want to add at this stage as we're coming to an end? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Druri. Actually, uh, in response to all the colleagues here, and uh, this is uh, uh, something I want to emphasize: that the bill that has been pushed by Marzouk al Ghanem and the dominant class in Kuwait, including the central apparatus, you know, uh, the right, uh, 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 you know, the racist right, if so to say, in Kuwait, uh, must not be overlooked. I think we should use it to, uh, 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 doc as a documentation of systematic targeting of the Badoon as an entire social group, because it has all the hallmarks of demonizing, intimidating, socially erasing the Bedouin community. I think this bill in itself should be used as an, ev uh, as an evidence of all the histories, the processes of scapegoating, exclusion, mar marginalization, and everything against the Bedouin community. I would advocate using this bill as an ex as an evidence of the processes, the attempts by the dominant class just to erase the Bedouin from the existence from Kuwait. Because the bill says within one year, once passed, within one year, the Bedouin have to uh, 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 m m uh, 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 present passports by one way or another. Otherwise, they will have more violence inflicted on them. So if, if we want to appeal to the international community, just to use this bill, translate it in English, and see how itself proves how the state is being inflicting violence on the Bedouin. Thank you very much. Goodness me. I mean, yes, such a challenge. Look, okay, Hakim, if you're there with Mohammed Salah. Dori. And, yeah, and please, Dori. Yes, hi, Drory. I, I would like uh, I would like to give the time to uh, to Mohammed Salem, and later and then just give me thirty seconds to just to speak to the community, please. Just to give okay. the time and, for my time for now. Okay, but please. before but before Mohammed Salem starts, and 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 I would like to turn to Batul as well. One of the questions yes. that came on the YouTube space was how do you ensure a diverse representation of the Badoon community without creating more division and it being less effective in terms of advocacy? The Kuwaiti state can use this to oppose different groups and weaken the voice of the Badoon. So, uh, so Mohammed or, or Hakim, can you address, and, and, I'll, and Betul, I'll come back to you as well, uh -huh. um, how do we, how do you, 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 you people, you lot, you activists who are in Kuwait, sitting in Kuwait, how can you and we help you in a way ensure this diversity of representation of your own community without creating more division and less effectiveness in terms of advocacy? Is it possible? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Drory, I'll give you the answer to Mohamed Salah. Ahlan, Ahlan Mohamed. Ahlan, Ahlan Mohamed. Ahlan, Ahlan Mohamed. Uh, I will seize the moment to just uh, tackle a few questions that has been addressed through uh, YouTube and the issue that has been raised okay. now uh, about, about uh, activism. Uh, we'll seize... Not we will be granted citizenship. We'll seize citizenship if we have 
a nation that respects and addresses on just footing all of its inhabitants, citizens, nationals, immigrants, uh, immigrant workers, and visitors. Reform is a pivotal issue here. At the moment, there are discrepancies when we when addressing the matters of uh, issues uh, erupting in Kuwait. Corruption, equal citizenship, and other issues. Whilst some apparatus trolls describe themselves in the social media as red Indians in our own country. Uh, corruption is also is not uh, c critically uh, and uh, perfectly defined. Uh, citizenship is also not properly defined. Citizenship will, if given in a just and equal footing, uh, not considered as a cup that some have in full and others have a sip of and fear of its evaporating. There is a general mistake in addressing uh, uh, the Bedouin problem as a problem. While it's a mess, it's a huge mess. Many stakeholders, many understandings, many effects in, all, in, in so many aspects. The international human bodies and activists, uh, we must remedy the mess during uh, the process. Remedy it and keep on tracking it. International human bodies and activists are thought of as colleagues in the journey. They are with us in the same car. They are not bystanders. They should not be bystanders. Okay. Uh, when when we when you're, you're sure you are you sure they're not hanging on the outside of the car looking in? <laughs> <laughs> I hope that they are with us in the same seat in the dri either uh, maybe will t they will take the driver seat so, uh, once or the passenger seat. Uh, they have to keep their eyes on the road at all times. At all times. Uh, that way, if they are just sitting Mohammed, and who, watching sorry, for Mohammed, developments... Who, Mohammed, who are you talking about here? Are you talking about people in Kuwait, your own community, or are you talking about the international NGO community? Who are you talking about here? Everybody. We are all stakeholders here. The, the, the activists inside, the activists outside, the international human communities, and the international... The, form the, the UNHCR, UNDP, and the others. They all have to keep their eye on the track. Let me give a small example here. Uh, you mentioned the issue of uh, COVID-19, the problem of COVID-19 during the, 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 the first phase, uh, there was a public relations uh, campaign brought by the apparatus, saying that, okay, now we'll soften up the procedures, uh, we'll, let be, we'll remove the block over people's bank accounts, now they, have, they can draw their money, uh, they can go, uh, we'll offer uh, uh, health access. But that was for in the first phase when the whole world was considering how, how about uh, the lower classes, how about the, the undocumented, how, you see where I'm going? But after two or three months, all the, all the blockades came back again. It was just a soft campaign. It's a, uh, a public relations campaign, as always. We are solving everything, the, the predicament of the government. We are, we are solving everything. Now we are dealing with them. We're taking the matter into our hands. There are, there are documented and uh, uh, undocumented, and we are looking into the matter and their benefits. <laughs> the benefits are two, two, three our hanging rope. When removed for a moment, many people, many suffering Bedouins will be obsolete. Thank you, Vince. Mohammed, thank you very much. Look, I, 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 uh, I just want to go go back to Dana. Dana um, Abdelaziz in, 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 in New York is back with us. Um, uh, Batul, just hang with us. Don't go. Uh, others, the others who are still with us too. I see a couple. Um, look, Dana, just to go back to your American, for want of a better term, perspective on things. If you are here. Um, just, I just want to ask you just your thoughts on, on the stuff that you've been hearing. It's an issue. It starts in Kuwait. It, 
people don't understand. I spoke to a different kind of Bedouin people reaching out to me about oh leaving Kuwait and coming to the US. They're not realizing that, like I was telling a lot of people, there's two groups of Bedouin. There's Bedouin who are considered stateless and refugees, and there are Bedouin who's considered only stateless. And the most affected people are the ones that only consider us stateless because they come to the US. They assume that there is a law that they could apply for asylum. They could apply for help. No. They get stuck in the U.S. And it's a dilemma. And then they reach out to the Kuwaiti embassy to go back. They can't go back. And then mm. when they also reach out to the Kuwaiti embassy stating, can you please provide us documents? They're stating that we are not a na- national of Kuwait or any type of, it like, basically to have proof of documents for them to give to the U.S. government. They're refusing that. So what happens is, is that, in my in my opinion, my point of view, is that Kuwait is basically trying to eliminate them by not documents for them to go abroad and, and seek help, and seek citizenship, and not to come back. So basically, it's a new form of slavery, but in, in a modern way. That's what exactly happening to not only Bedouin um, from the Kuwait, from any stateless person, because they're their countries are, are not providing. It's it's becoming, but as as a stateless my organization, we are trying to get a law passed stateless people for protection for them because they are not protected they are being thrown in detentions you have minors Bedouin minors mm. are being thrown into detentions we're talking about less than the age of 15 and they can't deport them so now they stuck in detention for years and then, then they are released some of them are not released and Kuwait is claiming that some of them are from a different country. And it's a huge problem because it's like now the U.S. is deporting stateless people to different countries. So it's it's a I mean, huge problem. Donna, Donna, what I hear from what you're saying is almost uh, a kind of extraterritorial application of racist and, and, and indeed patriarchal. Um, approaches that that uh, that are almost genocidal in its in its inability t- to acknowledge existence of another people of mm-hmm. you um, and and um, I, I I I personally have never thought about the extraterritorial application of these these provisions which 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 relegates the existence of. Uh, of, 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 of so many people in Kuwait. Look, any other thoughts before I go to Batul and, and maybe to any others who want to wrap yeah. up? Just any other thoughts, Donna, if you would. One last thing is that it is a type of, it's like the new modern of how to prosecute people, genocide. This is exactly what they're doing. And Bedouin, who are, whose mothers are Kuwaiti, and they watching their children die in front of them. You have mothers who left Kuwait and stood outside in in basically the Western or in London or in the U.S. because they can't go back because they're children. Their children cannot go back. So it's the new way of killing killing them. It's the new way of genocide. It's, uh, like I always say, it's, it's the new form of slavery. Donna, before you go... Just for other people to hear a little bit about your personal background, which I I didn't I wasn't I able to enough, to yeah, give. Is there something very brief that you'd like to say about your own experience and your own history that that in, that that forms what is clearly a very emotive issue for you as you speak? I see it in in your I, I hear it in your voice. I see it in your face. Your this is something which which is uh, that that, it's, that it's seems to touch you quite deep, deeply. Yes, it's sad because I have a brother. I have a brother who died as a Bedouin, who, who was murdered in 2010 as a Bedouin, and he did not have no ID. He did not have anything. Could I, could, 
could my mother send him back to Kuwait to bury him? No. Could she seek help? No. And it bothers me the most. And as a minor, I did experience um, detention. So it's it's a it, lot for me to see this. Detention in the U.S., Donna? Yes. Wow, that's that's an absolutely incredible um, and, 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 and very powerful uh, story. That's, that's really awful. Um, and I, again, I'm just so shocked at the, the extraterritorial, the outside of Kuwait application of, of what seems to be incredibly racist um, 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 policies. Look, I, I, in no disrespect, I, I need, we need to wrap it up. We're so over time. I want to turn back to Batul, um, if, uh, if we can. Batul, if you're still here, yes, are you with I'm us? Here. Great, here. great, great, great. Look, just, uh, you know, we are, we are running out of time. They're, they're, we've run out of time, actually, more than run out of time. Um, any thoughts that you might have about this, about going forward, messages that you may have to Tara, to Devon, to Zahra, these, these groups that are working on this issue, uh, to us about how we campaign, where we campaign. What are your thoughts after hearing all, all that you've heard? Okay, uh, first of all, I can't tell anybody to do anything because I trust that everybody will do whatever they want to do and that's important. Here's the <laughs> thing, that's something I want to distinctify. I'm not here to tell somebody, everybody go do arts, no. For me as a woman, it's the safest way for me to like, for example, show my, right. let's say, my protest. So what I would recommend is just giving space for people to express themselves and not to look at it, oh, really? So it's going to make some change. Yes, it will make some change. Nobody's going to like tell you, oh, your experience is wrong. And if they do, it's my experience. Who are you telling mm -hmm. my experience is not real? So this is why, like, any sort of way you express yourself is important as a way of expressing yourself and self-expression is the first way of shifting a power dynamic because it's you who's telling your story i am done with people telling me how i should identify myself no i don't want anybody to tell me how to identify myself i know what i am and i'm done people talking on my behalf it's important but i know i have a voice it's very important so i think just giving space for people and diversifying the way people can for example, have access to activism because activism is for the privileged. It's not for everybody. Like for us to have a voice, it's it's a privilege. So uh, just give some space for more people to be privileged with that. Okay, okay, but we'll have a launching on a Kuwaiti website and resource. Um, Hawiati Zahra and, uh, and, and, and her colleagues are, are at Hawiati. What if I were to turn it around and say, you have at your disposal this website, Anna Kuwaiti, to talk about your experience, your thoughts, uh, any art you'd like to share, any poetry you'd like to share. Is that kind of thing that you think might interest you? You might think about, well, I've got this poem about, um, I don't know, about this flower um, <laughs> okay. that, uh, that somehow touches the Badoon experience. And yet you can put it on the Anna Kuwaiti website. Is that something that might stir you, that might appeal to you? Actually, it's interesting you say that because during the beginning of the pandemic, me and Neda Faris, she's a very famous Kuwaiti writer and just an influencer, we had that idea and we kind of started working on it. And should I have known that, you know, Anna Kuwaiti already existed, we would have joined efforts. So yes, 100%. That's something that we're very interested in as a society, and it's very important. And I think it's such a great place to start. And can I just bring up something? Because I was mm. checking the comments in the Arabic uh, section, and some people are telling me songs will not change anything. I'm not telling you sing songs about the Bedouin community or Ana Bedouin, Ana Bedouin. If you want to, sure. But no, I'm talking about say your story. Say your story. It's not going to change anything, but it's your voice. It's your way of putting out your, your voice. People underestimate. And the fact that they're looking down upon this sort of activism is just by itself a problem. It's just by itself a problem. No, you have to acknowledge that this is important. Songs, If songs weren't important, then just turn off your radio or something. So no, basically that's one important aspect, important. And, and, and a Kuwaiti is a, such an interesting 
aspect and I'm very, very proud to be part of this. Thank you for giving me this chance and thank you everybody for like just giving me this platform. I appreciate no, it. That's, that's absolutely great. That's really great. Look, I, 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 we're so overdue. Thank you so much, Batul. Um, any absolutely burning questions, Hakeem, uh, Mohamed Salim, uh, Claire, uh, Ahmed, anyone, Zahra, anyone who's out there in the ether who'd like to make any final burning questions or comments uh -huh. before we wrap up? Drawing. You wanted to make some, so you wanted to, to address, uh, ad make a comment. Yes. Okay, I will, uh, first of all, I would like to say, wait, first, where is my camera? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, we need to see you. We need to, yeah, good. We, we missed that yeah. beard. Yes, okay. First of all, I would like to say that there, no one left behind. No one. The community, the activists, the people who's helping us, even the Kuwaitis who's trying to help us and they are, they are getting punished by the government, the Kuwaiti government, for their privilege uh, and uh, for, for their, their, their access for, for uh, other services. They, are, they are, have been, a lot of people, Kuwaiti people, have been punished because of, of, uh, of, uh, 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 of activism in the Kuwaiti Bidun case. That's one thing. Second, we are human rights defenders. And... Uh, the, the, uh, when we are trying to defend our community, that means we are defending everyone. We are defending their right to, uh, to express themselves. They can, uh, they can uh, do whatever they want. We will defend on this. Uh, first of all, all the, all the women, all the children, uh, all the boys, all the people who's, who's uh, trying to drone, all the people who's, who's, who have in, uh, the, the uh, Twitter accounts, uh, uh, they are showing with their faces or with their names uh, or be, maybe they are using uh, fake uh, usernames or whatever. Our mission is to defend the, the community, all of it. And uh, uh, there is no area closed on someone. All the areas in the case is open to everyone to participate and to work on this. This is the, my message for, uh, for in, in general. And I have another message in Arabic, please. I will take just a little, uh, yeah, maybe 30 seconds or one, one minute. Man. Okay. I would, I would like now to, to uh, put my face directly to, to the Kuwaiti Bidun community and say it in Arabic. Masaakum Allah Bakhair, Wallah Yatikum Alf Afia, Ya Mushtam Al Kuwaiti Bidun. Ana, Tuafet Walati Gibrat Al Tashum, U Khilal Al Yom Al Khamus, Wu Stadis, Wu Stabe. من وفاة والدتي اشتغلت وتحركت مع بقية الشباب ولله الحمد قدرنا ان احنا نهزم مرزوق الغانم في عقر داره في لعبته السياسية داخل المجلس الامة وقفنا القانون هذا بقوة رب العالمين اولا ومن ثم دعوات الناس الطيبة مثلكم وشرواكم واهلكم وجهود الشباب جميعا تعلموا من هذه التجربة ان لما تضافرت الجهود ولما الجميع ضحى بضمنهم تضحيتي أنا الشخصية اللي أني تركت في هذيك الأيام تركت حزني عضيت على الألم اللي أنا أحس فيه أنا وإسرتي واشتغلت في هذا الأمر معاكم مع بقية الشباب وقدرنا لله الحمد أن نوقف مرزوق الغانم والمجموعة اللي خلفه واليمين العنصري وجميع الأجهزة اللي موجودة خلفه اللي تدعم هذا القانون وتدعم محي هوية الكويتين البدون وأيضا تدعم تحويل الكويتيين البدون إلى إلى خارجين عن القانون ومخالفي الأقامة وبالتالي تحويلكم إلى مخالفين الأقامة ومن ثم إبعادكم خارج البلاد أيام معدودة أما أمامنا الحين تسع أيام فقط قبل نهاية الجهاز المركزي أتمنى من عندكم تتفهمون أن كل العالم معكم هذا الاجتماع أو هذه الندوة أو هذه الدوانية اللي صار لنا ثلاث ساعات الحين توضح لكم أن هناك أطراف من كل مكان في العالم من كل القارات كل القارات اللي موجودة فيها اللي موجود فيها البشر حول العالم فيها شخص أو شخصين قاعد يتكلمون عن قضية كويتي البدون وأنا أخوكم هني موجود وبقية الناشطين موجودين الكل يتعاون معاكم والكل يدعمكم لا تتخلون عن نفسكم الناس ما راح تخلى عنكم لكن أنتم عليكم واجب وأنتم عليكم المسؤولية الأولى وأنتم لكم القيادة أنتم يا شباب وبنات الكويتي البدون وأولكم الشباب والبنات تحديدا أنا أقول الشباب والبنات 
لان احنا اليوم بعد 10 سنوات من الحراك يعني بلش يبين فينا الهلاك والتعب لكننا لله الحمد مستمرين وانشانا مجموعات جديده وقواعد جديده ونتمنى من عندكم تستمرون في هذا الخط وراح نتعاون معاكم نتعاون مع الجميع لكننا محتاجين من عندكم جهود افضل واكثر والله يعطيكم العافيه وشدوا حيلكم انا كويتي وانتم كويتيين والكويت بلدكم ولا تخلون احد ولا تنطرون من احد انه يقول لكم انتم مو كويتيين او والله انتم من هذه الدوله او هذيك الدوله او والله يحاول يقلل من شانكم او يتنمر عليكم لا تعطون مجال لاي احد انه يقلل من احترامكم او يتنمر عليكم وشكرا يعطيكم العافيه شكرا ثانك يو دوري اوكي حكيم باتشل مانشن ذات ذاتس اباوت ذات واز فيري موفينج لوك ايفريبادي اي وونت تو ثانك يو اول ذات اباوت ذس ذس از جوينغ تو بي Uh, uploaded on the uh, on the on the on the Anakwiti website. If there's anything that you want taken out from anything that you said, let me know. Let us know. Um, otherwise, I want it to remain as a resource that we can all go back to and cite as a step along the path of resolving this incredibly frustrating issue that has hurt so many people. Um, in such profound ways. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, Hakeem, thank you very much. And Hakeem, I can see that you're speaking to somebody else anyway. Everyone, thank you so much for, for, uh, for, for joining. Um, I don't know quite how to end this thing, but I think maybe our colleague uh, Abbas can do that for us. Um, just, I just want to thank you all. For those, if there's any people still watching this on YouTube, Um, taking part and engaging. I know Fayez, Fayez had to leave for a meeting, um, but I hope this is, this is opening a door for Tara, for Devin, for, for, uh, uh, for Zahra, for all of us to engage a little bit more, share our resources, come together a bit more. Um, I want us to turn to the, the Anna Kuwaiti website. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks, thanks so much for, for taking part. And uh, Ahmed does as well as he comes into the room. So I don't know how to turn this thing off, but, but I'm, I'm good to be leaving now. So thanks, thanks so much everyone and, and good night to wherever you are. Without recognition, without a nationality, Bedouin citizens in Kuwait. Bedouin in Kuwait lives between two lifestyles, a life of welfare that surrounds them and a life of fear that dominates them. What does it mean for them to be classified under the category of Bedouin in Kuwait in the country of oil and constitutional rights? According to the United Nations charters, it's not permissible for a person to be without an identity and a nationality, to take refuge in a world that is mainly based on obtaining a recognized identity and nationality to know his basic human rights. Although the problem of stateless persons is spread almost all over the world, it is considered more evident and a tragedy in Kuwait And due to its seriousness, it can be said that the Bedouin problem in Kuwait analyzes what can be called the diaspora and the homeland. This is Tayma, the main place for the Bedouin. As you can see, the distance of the Bedouin is about 100 to 150 from the Bedouin and the Bedouin. This is why the Bedouin group are making every effort to gain official recognition of their rights to enjoy the nationality that they are striving to obtain from the government that still doesn't recognize this right. The only recognition that the Bedouin receives in Kuwait is the legal definition as Kuwaiti law refers to these people as stateless persons. They complain of discrimination against them on all levels and the difficulty of enjoying basic state services such as education, housing, employment, healthcare and others. The story of the Bedouin in Kuwait began with the tribes people who, 
After the emergence of oil in Kuwait, they changed from Kuwaitis to Kuwaitis Bedouins, non-Kuwaitis, stateless, and finally, to illegal residents. Practically, the Bedouin problem was not of significant meaning before Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in August 1990. The Bedouin enjoyed many of the privileges that Kuwaiti citizens could obtain. After the liberation of Kuwait from the Iraqi invasion in February 1991, the government authorities launched a violent clearance campaign against the Bedouin under the pretext of their cooperation with the Iraqi occupation. This violent policy caused the migration of thousands of stateless persons from Kuwait to other parts of the world as refugees. It reduced their number to between 90 and 110,000 people by 2010. They also lost most of their privileges during this period, including access to government jobs, free health care, or even to obtain birth and marriage certificates. The Bedouin became deprived of basic rights such as education, health care, and the right to employment. <laughs> In 2014, a controversial statement was issued by the Assistant Under Secretary of the Ministry of the Interior, where he said that tens of thousands of stateless people, Bedouin, could obtain the economic citizenship of the Republic of Comoros as they register as citizens of the African country, whereas those who come to this step will receive government facilities represented by permanent residency free education and health care. Naturally, the statement faced angry reactions from the Bedouin, who considered it is a great insult to them, which led to the failure to implement any of its contents. The Bedouin were held demonstrations to demand their rights in the Jahra area in 2011, in which they clashed with the Kuwaiti police and injured some of them. And after the Kuwaiti National Assembly refused to rediscuss the Bedouin rights report, so a free Bedouin youth group and many committees and organizations were established, seeking to internationalize their case with the help of a third party to obtain their rights, and their actions of the representatives of the National Assembly were directed towards the necessity of solving the Bedouin problem to save Kuwait's international reputation. المشكلة في هذه القضية بالذات أن هناك من يستحق الجنسية يجب أن يجنس وهناك من لا يستحق الجنسية يجب أن يعني يتعامل معه بطريقة أخرى. كل هذا لم يتم. تصريحات بعض المسؤولين في وزارة الداخلية هنا هناك نحن كمشرعين لا تعنينا لا من قريب ولا من بعيد وإنما ما يعنينا ماذا ستقدم الحكومة لحل هذه المشكلة ولحل هذه الأزمة. Also, the decision to naturalize 2,000 people annually will not solve this issue for 50 years, as Kuwait is under criticism from international human rights organizations and embarrassment in international forums. We would like to draw the Council's attention to Kuwait's ongoing human rights violations, especially concerning non-citizen and stateless persons, also known as Bidzun, in contravention to recommendations it received during its second cycle, UPR, in 2015. This was my first incident to see uh, uh, Taima and to see how the stateless people live, live in Kuwait. And uh, uh, when I entered these houses, I, I realized that there is a, a great difference between what we, what we live in as Kuwaitis and how the people in Taima or the stateless people in Kuwait are living. The standards of living are totally different. Uh, and it's not just about poverty, it's about complications. It's complicated life in general. And for me, one of the very major, you know, apart from poverty, complications, uh, and, and all sorts of... Uh, uh, marginalization that I felt uh, when I was there. Uh, one, of, one of the main uh, uh, incidents that really affected me is that uh, this, the story of a, of a young girl who died in this fire. Uh, and she was 13 years old. And, I, and when I was talking to her, to her auntie and her father, they were very, uh, very much uh, uh, 
in tears because the girl didn't have a birth certificate, neither a death certificate. Uh, and for me, this was very, very cruel. I mean, to realize that there's a person who have been deprived of any kind of identity. Uh, she's been 13 years in, her, in life, but there's no evidence that she has ever existed. We are reaching now to a point that we stop anymore to give evidence to everyone that we are related to Kuwait because finish uh, already we done a lot and all everyone know that exactly that we are Kuwaitis we are citizens but the government having another plan so the community itself alhamdulillah yani, thanks to God that we reach to the point that all the community know exactly the Bedouin related to Kuwait but there is uh, there is some uh, like uh, uh, you know uh, a problem between the government and us. It's like, uh, what you call it, uh, okay. a yeah, political problem, yes. Yeah. Despite this, the Bedouin group still lives hope in solving their problem and recognizing their rights to acquire a nationality and the nation's recognition of them as citizens. And until that hope is achieved, the Bedouin will continue to live with fear and organized exclusion. أنا كويتي وأبوي كويتي وجدي كويتي وراح نظل في هذه الأرض حتى يشاء الله عز وجل